Steve Scott here on Face Out Radio for another night of high quality radio. And the only thing that's pissed me off so far tonight is our guest, Alex Mistretta, usually only gets into the heavy duty workloads when he is shirtless, but he's decided to put a shirt on tonight. And I'm a little pissed off about that because when he is, when it shirts off, it's like hockey. When the gloves are off, anything can happen. And with Alex, when the shirt is off, anything can happen. But I think we got a tame version of Alex tonight. Thank you so much for everybody joining us. Before we bring Alex in, let's give a rundown of everybody who is in our chat room so far. Cloudy with a chance of UFOs takes home the gold medal position. Race fan with a silver. And the gorgeous Emily Bigelow, otherwise known as Alaska's greatest athlete, with the bronze medal tonight. The Ronald Penton and the gorgeous Cosmic Floor. How are you? Andrew, nice to see you. Mennonite Abe and Ed Claydor are here. Ed, thank you so much for kicking off the Super Chat tonight. It's a great way to support what we do here on a nightly basis. Thank you so much. Steam Train Mark in Australia, thank you for letting us know that we are alive in the future. Since you live in the future, we appreciate that. Hello there, stunning Steph Dickey in Florida. Good to see you. Gorgeous Jenny Metz. Thanks for coming on in. We appreciate that. SJ, Jay Breezy, Mama Susan, Iberada in Singapore. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you for joining us. Awesome Annie Svensson has returned. Good to see you, Annie. Annie, by the way, will be signing autographs after the show. Line up to the right of the studio. To the right of the studio. Luscious Jules will be signing autographs after the show as well. Line up to the left of the studio for Jules. And once again, awesome Annie Svensson on the right. Hello, gorgeous Michelle C. How are you? Nice to have you here. Double Tim, thanks for coming on in. Appreciate you, buddy. And uh, Go66, the best teeth of all listeners, the gorgeous Jessica Lee. Not only does she have great teeth, but fantastic hair as well. Ross Lambda, good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Jose, what's up, man? Ozzy, Ozzy, oi, oi to you. Chad Smith, Travis DeLuca, Magnus. Fabster, how's it going, man? And uh, we love you, Fabster. Thank you uh, for uh, doing what you do, man. Love you. Right there. You know what that means. Uh, Glenn McEnroe. <clears throat> He's about to throw a tantrum on the referees right there. Glenn McEnroe, everybody. Nicola and Mondak. Ozzy, Ozzy, sister, sister, good to see you. Olin, nice to have you here, buddy. Ross, good to see you. The gorgeous Laura Stevens has returned, everyone. Give us a wave, Lauren, if you don't mind. And uh, 509er, how are you? Thank you for joining us. All right, that's where we were, and where are we now? And the gorgeous Jenny, Brian49, how are you guys? Adam Lane, good to see you. BGs, Guillaume, how are you, buddy? Mental Pancakes, thank you for coming on in. Greg Moyes, good to see you. Todd Purden, nice to have you back, bud. And uh, hello, teen, how you doing, man? <coughs> I like your comment. Dang, you might be right. Alex does look like a living dinosaur. That's right. He may be. We don't know. Uh uh, let's see. Jeff Irechick, how you doing, man? Good to have you here. Bonjour, Julien. Comment ça va? Nice to see you. Adam Lane, good to have you here. Uh, the gorgeous Sherry Knight has returned. Give us a wave. There she is, everybody. The Wheat Queen from Brandon. We got Manitoba Becky. We love you, Manitoba Becky. How you doing? And uh, let's see here. Who else we got that's in the chat room? Grandmaster has returned. Give us a bow, Grandmaster. Give us a bow. Van Gogh, good to see you. Where have you been hiding? Jack Clark, good to see you. Focus, nice to have you back. Rooted in gorgeous sacredness has returned. Yes, she will give a curtsy every time you say rooted in gorgeous sacredness. It's true. She told me. Umuamua, good to have you here. And uh, unlike Eric, this is my first best show, not my fourth. We are Eric with a K's. Fourth favorite show, people. We are number four. Oh, look who it is. The pride of Saskatchewan. It is the gorgeous and talented Kara McIver. She has arrived, people. She has arrived. There she is. Let, let, let's give her a little shot there. there. Hi, Dave. There it is. There it is. Hi there, stunning Helena. How are you? Good to have you here. All right, we are about 45 seconds away from launching. The guy beside me 
literally right there. Right there. No, right there. There. Alex Mistretta, international man of mystery. Yes, he does his best work when he's half naked. But not tonight. It's all good. What, what kind of glass is that? Uh, I this. From the mountains of central British Columbia to you listening around the world, this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. I am your host, Dave Scott, sitting in the captain's chair of SOR headquarters. We welcome you to tonight's show on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor hit that subscribe button. You can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Tonight's show, show is brought to you by Chive Charities. Help make the world 10% happier by visiting Chive Charities today. You can find them on our website. All right. Alex Mistretta is one of the few full-time professional investigators in the paranormal field. He is the former MUFON Los Angeles Director of Investigations, founder of Phenomena Research, co-founder of the UFO and Paranormal Research Society of Los Angeles, and former member of Big Cats in Britain. Following his studies in anthropology and psychology at the University of Illinois, Chicago, Alex has devoted his life to research into the paranormal, UFOs, hidden history, and cryptozoology. This man is also a part of TESA, the Experiencer Support Association. He's hanging out with a lot of Canadians. I don't know why, but he is. And he's one of the good guys. And, and the only silly thing about Alex is he surfs. You know what happens when you go in the ocean, people? Sharks eat you. You know, they look at Alex. He's 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 thin. He's like six foot four. He's like 108 pounds. That's it. Okay. So there's no meat on the bones there. So he's safe every time he heads out into the Pacific with the great whites to go catch a wave. But the main thing is he survived. He's here. And we're talking some monsters and dinosaurs tonight. Alex, how are you doing, buddy? Great, man. Thanks a lot for having me on. That's the best intro I've heard for a while. Yes. Now, one thing I love about your research is two things. Number one, you're very forward. We may not agree on everything, but you're very forward and you're very you're very direct with what you feel this field needs in order to prove a lot of this stuff. But number two, you're not afraid to go into those heavy discussions on how to get things done, how to work them properly, how to make things going. Before we get into all of that, why did you decide, uh, an educated guy, you've got a scientific kind of background, why did you decide to really get into UFOs, ghosts, Bigfoot, Mokili, Mabembe, which we're going to get into later on? It's, it's actually backwards. I actually went into psychology uh and anthropology because of the paranormal and cryptozoology. So I went into psychology because I wanted to have a good base uh, for ufology and uh, the paranormal, right? Because before you go into parapsychology, you kind of got to know the basics. And anthropology, obviously, because of cryptozoology. So I had interest in those fields prior to that based on, you know, some experience I've had as a kid and just interest in this field since I was like six years old, you know? So I literally went to college specifically with this field in mind, so really, yeah, you know, absolutely. out of all the times we've talked, I've never heard that. Yeah, yeah, I know. I don't know. Yeah, actually, I never really, never really mentioned it because it's kind of unusual, I guess. But and no one really thinks about it. But yeah, I mean, hundred percent. That was my sole purpose to go to college. You know, and mind sports. But okay, so why did you want to direct your college education to a to a realm that nothing has been proven? Because I like to make life difficult for myself. You know, I mean, honestly, there's days where I think, man, if I could go back, I would just stay away from this field entirely because I didn't think 
it would be this difficult to make it work, you know? I thought initially that if I could get, you know, a degree or a couple degrees or whatever, I'd be able to have a little more juice and I'd be able to kind of bridge the gap between academia, science, and and people in this field and in this field in general. And I thought I would get a lot more respect than I ended up getting by, you know, being able to kind of walk right in between. So, you know, because my my philosophy has always been everything can be answered. Everything, you know, there's a there everything can be proven, everything can be documented if you just kind of find the right angle, you know. So but I didn't realize that both academia and science on one side and the paranormal on the other side weren't all that thrilled with that approach and really and a lot of people don't really want answers for a variety of reasons, you know. So yeah, I well, regret it a little bit at times, to be honest, you know, but it's you know, it's what it is. That brings up a good point. Why do you think so many people in this field don't have aspirations for true answers to what is going on? Partly, I think there's a fear aspect. You know, answers are scary because all of a sudden, if you have somebody like myself who is arrogant enough or cocky enough to say they can get answers, you know, it all of a sudden everything becomes very real. You can't hide anymore behind, you know. It's not, it's not just an internet conversation anymore. It's not just Google, you know, Bigfoot, Google, Chupacabras, Google, aliens. It becomes very real. And I think there's an innate fear of the unknown that even people in this field, you know. And I think, unfortunately, it also attracts a lot of very non-progressive personalities. We've kind of found out, you know, the last few years. And those people just, you know, kind of want to look back. They don't want to go forward. It's just like, again, maybe it's based on fear. It's based on maybe feeling inferior on some level because maybe they don't have an education or, you know, or or they've been bullied. And all of a sudden they've kind of found a community where they can be accepted, right, by being in a paranormal. It's kind of like a bunch of outsiders kind of get together. And I understand that 100%, you know. So I think when somebody comes along and starts challenging that position where, well, starts saying people on the outside, academia, science whoever has made fun of you all this year is actually just as worthy to be part of this conversation as we are i think that's becomes a bit of a challenge i think to some people you know and i'm not the most diplomatic person in the world as, as you know so you know and so i think part of that is because i found myself so i guess because of that i found myself so often kind of stuck in the middle and getting angry with you know both sides well you know you bring up a good point because this also gets into the entire politics of all of these fields. And it doesn't matter whether it's UFOs, whether it's ghosts. I think a lot of those politics are based on whether or not people really want answers in this field. I mean, you yeah. have people out there such as yourself or, or Ross Allison or, or a uh, number of other people out there who are looking for the answers to these most outrageous questions of monsters, ghosts, aliens, and then you have your thrill seekers. The thrill seekers aren't really there for answers. And I, I love it when the thrill seekers talk about, well, we got to go get evidence. We got to go get evidence. And they have no friggin' clue what they're going to do with that evidence. Yeah. Nothing. And, and I see your point, but this is where the game gets quite political. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, hundred percent. I sort of compare it to like, you know, like, as you know, I ski a lot, you know, and there's when we go out on these trips, I used to go out with a bunch of friends. It'd be like seven or eight of us would go out for a week, you know, and there's people that love skiing, love the process We're you know, we're there early in the morning, ski all day, go out of bounds, climb, you know, the ski down some chutes. And there's people that love the idea of skiing. So they like to go down a little bit easy, talk about it, go to the bar and talk to the girls, you know, and I think we have the same phenomena in this field. There's a lot of guys like the idea of being investigators because it's cool and you know, and it's safe on YouTube. It's safe, you know, going from conference to conference. It's safe staying behind the keyboard, but very few actually want to go out there. And and on top of that, very few have done the work to be able to go out there and do quality work, you know, and, and have a, not, not enough of a knowledge background to be able to do it. And with, you know, with social media, it doesn't matter anymore. As long as you talk really loud, you know, you, you scream the loudest, you have the most amount of clicks and likes. It doesn't matter if you've actually done the work or if you know what you're doing. And I think, you know, and now people can't tell these two modalities apart, you know, so. Are there answers out there, though? 100%. I, I firmly believe everything can be answered. It, we might have to 
expound upon everything that we know to get them. You know, we might have to take science and research a whole other level. And I'm not saying we're not, you know, we can all get them initially, but I firmly believe everything can be answered because if you don't feel that way, I don't see the point of going out there and trying. Okay. So l let's look into that for a little bit, you know, because we can both agree that, that there's many in the field who claim they want answers, but really they're not conducting anything scientific. They're conducting opinion, you know, and I think that's dangerous. Whether you're into the woo or whether you're into the scientific fact, if you're eliminating anything before you've actually researched it, you haven't conducted anything scientific. That's my opinion on it. All right. And, you know, over the years of doing this show, that's how I have kind of come to that conclusion. But Alex, for, for those who are looking for the thrill, is there anything wrong with, with people just wanting to go on a ghost hunt and, you know, maybe get tapped on the shoulder or get pinched or, or get shoved or catch a photograph of a shadow person or a ghost? Oh, not at all. I think it's great. I think people should be able to enjoy the paranormal in any way that they want, you know, but it, there's just different ways to do it. I mean, there's just, you get to differentiate between just like going out and having a good time, having fun and the social aspect of this. And I enjoy it too. I like to go ghost hunting, you know, with buddies or whatever, go out there looking for UFOs and, you know, but like if I take a tourist trip, I don't call it research. You know, if you take a tourist, if you take a tourist trip to go to the pyramids, you're not doing pyramid research. You're just taking a trip, you know, somewhere where there's, you know, pyramids, you know, and, or, if you take a tour to go, you know, ghost hunting for now, you're not really doing research, you're just taking a tour. And I think we have to differentiate between the people. And it doesn't mean that one's better than the other. It's just different. It's just two very different things. You know, we have to understand that research is a very different animal to just going out and having a good time if, you know. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. It's like, you know, when I used to do our haunted tours at the local museum, we weren't there for to to solve any mysteries. We were right. there to give people a good time and raise money for the museum. That yeah. was the focus. That was the goal. And hopefully the spirits would come out and play and understand. That's why we would go into every building before the tour and we would literally say, hey guys, we have a tour tonight. This is to help keep your home safe and keep your home funded. You know, help us out. Give us a little bit, you know, and we would do that. It, it was about respect for for the field and, and for those who haven't crossed over and decided to stick around for a while. And you can, you can educate people too on what things really are, you know, and once you're in the field or in a haunted environment or wh whatever, you know, and sometimes it's just okay to just have fun. You know, I mean, I, I do it too, but I just, like, as I was saying, you know, I differentiate between when I do that and when I do, you know, bona fide hardcore research. So. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why we wanted to bring you on tonight, because I want to get into a lot of monsters with you tonight, man. I do. And I think you're one of the top guys out there who is not only looking for what everyone else is looking for, like Bigfoot or ghosts, you're out there looking for the weird stuff. If there's something weird out there, you know, whether it's people still seeing dinosaurs, whether it's Mokili Babembe in Africa or pterodactyls flying around the, the coastlines of Western North America right through down to Texas, you're on it. You're on board. Why do you go after those those real strange ones that people say they're having occurrences with? I don't know. I like things that other people aren't that interested in, I guess, things that don't get enough attention. It's like maybe it comes from my athletic background where I know for those that don't know, most, most people know me as a volleyball player, but I was actually uh, a fencer and a team handball player, two sports that very few people do. And, you know, and I think, so I like that. I remember like, I was actually, obviously much better at fencing and volleyball, but I like doing those things that other people aren't that interested in. You know, I just think I like to bring attention to things that don't get enough attention for whatever reason. It's always been something that's been real interesting to me, you know? So and I can't really tell you why, to be honest. It's just part of my personality, I guess. And I think, you know, also I think when so many people does Bigfoot, and it's obviously proven to be something really, really hard to get, you know, definite evidence for. And and I like to focus on, like, for example, when we talk Bigfoot, I like to focus on stuff in Central Asia or the Caucasus Mountains in Russia because very few people are out there. So perhaps there's a better chance to get evidence at a spot like that where there's very few people actually doing any kind of work, you know. So I think that's the other side of that too. 
Got a question from Filth here. Why is he wearing a shirt? <laughs> well, I'm actually been in talks with, which is something that happens to me once in a while. It usually doesn't go anywhere, but with funding, you know, sort of thing. So I was hoping that I look a little more uh, as like a guy that's actually looking for serious funding than some dude without a shirt off yelling. <laughs> now, there there is a side joke to this that we should let a lot of people in. And I, I kind of caused a little bit of a storm with that because if you, you know, Alex and I have been friends for a long time. And, and when you look through a bunch of his pictures, he always seemed to be posting pictures of him playing volleyball with a shirt off or surfing with a shirt off or doing, you know, lounging on his couch with a shirt off. And, and it just, it, it killed me, you know, because, you know, I, I would never do that. I mean, I, I'm a little chunky in certain areas. And and so anyways, you know, here's Alex, Mr. Uh, Beachbody, you know, walking around, you know, you know, hey, ladies, huh? hey, guys, look at me. I'm Alex, you know, and so I used to bug him about that. Yeah. And, and it's just continued. Yeah. You, you know, you know, kind of that guy got, got started years ago. By the way, you just mentioned the ladies. I got no game. If I'm going to be honest with it. But um, years ago, I was in talk to do a documentary and because I did a lot of adventure sports, you know, like bodyboarding, I bodyboard more than surf, you know, free dive or ski, whatever. They were going to do a show with me, half investigating, you know, uh, strange stuff and half like extreme sports. So that whole uh, image with the shirt off and hey, bro, kind of, you know, got started with that a little bit. Well, it looks good on you. It looks good to see you actually fully clothed tonight. That's nice. Appreciate that. You know, but let, let's get into this. You know, there's a lot of people in here who uh, who really have had experiences seeing monsters. Okay? Monsters that we can't explain. Monsters that were supposed to be dead millions of years ago. And yet, <clears throat> there's people still claiming to have these sightings little raptors running around Texas, miniature uh, Tyrannosaurus rexes have been spotted, thunderbirds going back 30, 40, 50,000 years, 40-foot wingspan being seen, pterodactyls, you know, uh, sea monsters, from the Loch Ness Monster to the Cadborosaurus. I mean, they're everywhere, these reports. Is, is this topic just romantic because we want to still have a tie to the past to all these amazing creatures that humanity will never see live or is it something else i think our interest in it is romantic but i think a lot of them have a very real basis in in biology once you really kind of get into it you know not all obviously not not everything's going to turn out to be real you know but i think you know our interest is romantic but i think it's a really real bona fide objective objectivity you know real to these animals so but if they're supposed to be extinct okay Loch Ness monster for yeah. instance or even Ogopogo here in British Columbia if they're supposed to be extinct what are people seeing or what are they confusing themselves with, with a creature that, or an animal or mammal that we know is in existence today? Give you an example. With Ogopogo, I want to believe it's a sea monster. But I also know that Okanagan Lake is the start of the Columbia River. The Columbia River, much like the Fraser River here in British Columbia, has a massive amount of very large white sturgeon that right. can grow that could grow up to 20 feet long, the size of a great white shark. Okay. Uh, they can surface and it causes ripples. They can get very big. They can be aggressive. They can be very dormant. And we know that they spawn in Okanagan Lake. So this is where I get a little bit confused. If for most of these creatures, are we is our mind projecting what they are, or is it actually a a live creature that people aren't recognizing? Because the majority of people out there, Alex, even if they've been boating on Okanagan Lake or other sea monster lakes, they're not used to seeing 
Yeah. Sturgeon. Well, I think, I think yes and no. Like, um, obviously, there's a lot of lake monsters around the world, right? You go in Scotland, you go from Loch Ness to Loch Morar, which is, you know, kind of next door. I mean, you have, you have them in Sweden, you have them in Iceland, you have them in Siberia. So I think we're, we're, we're dealing with more than just one type of species. 100% some of these lakes are sturgeons, who incidentally is a prehistoric animal, right? Sturgeon has been around for millions of years. So, you know, when we say prehistoric, people tend to think, well, see, it's something that's extinct, but that's not necessarily true. There's a plethora of animals alive today that were around during the time of the dinosaurs or prior to that or, or you know, before the Ice Age or whatever. So, but Ogopogo, obviously, to me, because of the description of it, is not a sturgeon, whatever it might be. It's, it seems very similar to me to Caddy, right? Cadbazaurus that you get that's not all that far away. So that one, I tend to lean a little bit more to being a real kind of an unknown species, for example, you know, where um, even a mammal, to me, it says mammal, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't think it's a dinosaur. I don't think it's a prehistoric animal. To me, I think if it exists, it's a mammal, as is caddy. I mean, you know, the swimming, the swimming motion, the up and down is very mammalian. The fact that it's been witnessed, you know, kind of spraying uh, out of its head like, like, a, like a whale. So... I think it depends on which location you're talking about, but I do agree though. It's, you know, lakes are finite bodies of water. So it becomes a little more problematic for a large animal to be able to stay hidden for so long, you know? So, but some of them, you know, I think like uh, the lager float worm in Iceland, I like a lot in terms of, you know, an unknown animal. The uh, the storage jerk, which I can't pronounce in Sweden, I like a lot as being something very different. You know, Loch Ness, I'm on the fence a little bit about uh late you know a couple lakes in siberia i'm pretty good about maybe being some unknown animals you know but so i think it all depends on where you go if we're getting if we're getting into you know the siberian area of russia where there's still a large portion of russia that has not been you know seriously looked at i still think and maybe it's romantic of me to think this i still think somewhere in russia there's still a pack of mammoths there's walking sightings. around there there has been sightings, you know, they, in fact, not so much lately. I heard of one from 1997 saying, I don't know how reliable it is, but I do know that in the early 1900s, um, hunters are talking about these hairy elephants they used to see in Siberia and the locals used to call them mountains of meat. So I don't, you know, the chance of them still being around today is obviously kind of slim, even though if you look at Siberia, especially Yakutia, for example, it's virtually unexplored. Nobody lives there. Nobody goes there. I mean, you can have a thousand mammoths in there and no one would see them for years, you know, doesn't mean they're there, but it's not completely out of, the, you know, out of the possibility. I mean, if you think mammoths went extinct, what, 4,000 years ago, at least on islands, maybe 10,000 on the mainland, right? So it's geological time. That's literally, that's like yesterday, you know? Well, there's a good point that it, I think they could still be there. Maybe not a large population, but maybe enough to stay hidden. Yeah, you know. I, I think it's a possible. I think it's a worthy, you know, it's worthy of study. And I've always kind of talked about hopefully one day getting an expedition out of Siberia for that and, you know, other things are out there. But well, on that note, what we're going to do, Alex, is we're going to get you to hold on. We're going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. Alex Mistretta, the international man of mystery when it comes to investigating everything weird and strange. We're going to get into. Mokili Mbembe. Is there a dinosaur still roaming the rivers of the Congo? This is a story that's very close to Alex. We'll get into it next on the Mighty SOR. Right at the beginning there, dude, I totally mistimed myself. I thought we had like 30 seconds left. And I'm like, oh no. No, why is the music playing? And I uh, just, oh, well, whatever. <clears throat> Dirty Phil, thank you so much for that super chat, man. Really appreciate that. Remember, everybody, that uh, if uh, Dirty Filth runs book our bookings along with the gorgeous Emily Bigelow, so if you have any guest suggestions, just go in there. Type in uh, on email, type in bookings at spacedoutradio.com and let them know who you want to see on the show. 
or what topics you want us to talk about. We'll try and track someone down. Hey, Nicholas, how you doing, man? Good to see you. And Eva, Eva, how are you? And who else is doing here? Oh, let's see here. <clears throat> hey, Aaron, good to have you here. That was a quick half hour, man. Yeah, it went by so quick. Dude, totally. All of a sudden, I saw this flashing on my screen, and that's my one-minute countdown. Oh, and I'm like, I'm like, really? Already? Son of a gun. That's a good sign, though. I mean, it's going well. Yeah. Because, man, I've been on some shows, and you're like, wait, how much time is left? How much time is left? <laughs> I, I remember about four years ago. I don't even remember the show it was. I went on one show as a guest, and literally... It was, this person was so excited to talk to me. Uh, instead of interviewing me, it was cut me off after every 15 seconds yeah. to tell to tell me their experience. And I and I was like, and, and I had committed to like 90 minutes to doing this, man. It was the longest 90 minutes of my life. Yeah. Delic, no. Delic Flower, welcome to our chat room. Thank you so much. Another newbie, Suzanne Fitzgerald is here, everyone, from the beautiful state of Texas. We get a lot of Texans listening to this show. I think it's fantastic. Mitchell Darling, welcome to the show. The Richard Elmore has arrived, everyone. The Richard Elmore. Yeah, we haven't had William Jevening on in a long time, probably three years. Probably due for him. All right, we've got about uh, two minutes, two and a half minutes, Alex. Yeah, no worries, man. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, we have done a Dogman only episode with Jody Cook. We've done a few of them. All right, I like some part of that one. Yeah, we can talk some Dogman tonight. We can talk everything. Still can't believe you got a shirt on. <laughs> yeah, that's first time all day, actually. <laughs> oh, man. Cutest thing happened today, man. Uh, hi, Boots here. Hi, Chris GP. Hi, Virgil. How are you, man? Uh, cutest thing happened today. So my little guy, I sold the warden, uh, him and his buddy who lived two, who lives two doors down, literally the last day of school, they had a falling out, oh. you know, in one of those little kid spats. So I'm thinking, okay, what can I do with my little guy today? I got the day off of my daytime job. So I figured, you know what? I'm going to surprise him. We're going to go down to the hardware store. We're going to buy like, 70 feet worth of plastic and make a slip and slide, you know? And literally I'm like, okay, got, buddy, like we're going to go in like five minutes and the door knocks and it's the other neighbor kids. And they're like, can Colby come out and play? And I'm like, yeah, of course. I said, Colby, do you want to play or do you want to go to town? He's like, I want to play. And just then uh, the boy from two doors down comes walking onto the driveway and he goes, I said, I said, hey, Bryce, how you doing? And he goes, I think I'd like to be friends with Colby again. I miss playing with him. <laughs> and so I, I called Colby, and Colby comes outside, and he's like, I'm like, hey, Bryce is here. What do you think? And he and big smile on his face. He's like, hi, Bryce. And I'm like, and I'm like, uh, and he's like, Dad, can I go out and play with my friends? Yes, son, go out and play. <laughs> So here I am doing laundry all day while my kid is swimming in their pool two doors down, <laughs> you know, and it was awesome. It turned out to be fantastic. We're going to go here in about 10 seconds. Big thank you to Dirty Filth, to Adam and to Ed for the awesome super chats. Hi, Robert Moore. How you doing? Good to have you here. Gorgeous Gene Beckett. Nice to see you. Uh, Ross Smith. Thanks for coming on in. Solar Warden, Mitch Darling, 416, the gorgeous Jessica McCreary. Here we go. Hi, 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 hi. 
second half hour of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are in this beautiful planet we call Earth. I want to remind you that if you miss portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do old Davey the favor. Hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with Alex Mistretta. He is a researcher out of Los Angeles, California, looking into everything weird and strange. And we're going to go into the jungles of the Congo here, where many people believe that there are still dinosaurs roaming around. The animal is called Mokili Mbembe. And this is a special one for Alex. If you're on our YouTube channel, you can actually see Alex wearing a shirt of Mokili Mbembe. I want that shirt, by the way. Totally want that shirt. Alex, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thanks again for having me on, man. What is Mokili Mbembe? Well, it's this guy, right? It looks, it's an uh, animal in the Congo and in uh, neighborhood countries that looks like a sauropod dinosaur. It was first... Uh, I remember what I just said. It looks like a sauropod dinosaur. It doesn't necessarily mean it's a sauropod dinosaur. So people in the West first started hearing about it in the uh, 1700s. And um, during, you know, a lot of the missionaries were down there and were coming back with stories of this huge footprints they would find, you know, in the jungle, that sort of thing. And then little by little, people started talking about it, talking about it. And then uh, there's a few sightings and there's some expeditions, uh, a few more sightings. And then... Um, Personally, I uh, found a book from a professor from uh, University of Chicago when I was in college. I was, I was in the library doing a paper, and I saw this book says Mokiri Membe, the lost dinosaur of the Congo. You know, so, and that's how I got into it. I saw the book and never brought it back. Stole it technically, and uh, I've been obsessed with it ever since. But um, yeah, so first, I let me set the stage a little bit when um, with the whole dinosaur thing. So people think dinosaur things that's something that went extinct 65 million years ago. And that's true, but it's, it's not. Um, if you look at different types of dinosaurs, sauropod and theropods, theropods are dinosaurs that are still alive today in the form of birds. They share some common ancestry with modern birds. So technically dinosaurs can completely go extinct. So from a biological standpoint, it's entirely possible that another different species of dinosaur, another type of dinosaur managed to survive in a very remote region and after 65 million years of very limited evolution, it turned out to be Mokide and Membe. And that seems to be the prevalent theory in terms of, or hypothesis, I should say, in terms of what Mokide and Membe might be. Uh, I'm not sold, to be honest, on the whole dinosaur thing. Uh, I know that sounds crazy for somebody who's so sure that this animal exists. And part of the reason I, I'm so sure is because I received firsthand uh, testimony from people in the Congo um, that, I, that, that have seen this animal. A few years ago, I spent two years working in an expedition that eventually never got off the ground because of the Civil War. And uh, so I had people on in the Congo and in the neighborhood looking into Mokede Membe. And I had some firsthand report from like fishermen that were, you know, on the rivers early in the morning. And then we'd see this animal come out of the water to kind of eat breakfast, so to speak. And um, the other thing, too, is I want to mention is the, the Congo Basin, for those who are not aware, it's 1.3 million square miles. It's bigger than Alaska. Most of it's unexplored. There's areas where no one's ever gone. It's huge. It also has a lot of prehistoric fi- uh, species, like the lungfish, for example, which is one, of, which is a fish that can actually walk on land, and it actually predates uh, dinosaurs. So, I'm, and it's also what's called a center of endemism, where a lot of species in that in the Congo Basin exist nowhere else on the planet. So if there's a place on the planet where it makes sense from a biological standpoint to have an animal like Mokede Membe, this is the place. Okay. So when was the last sighting of this creature that we know of? A couple years ago. And what happened there? There was, I don't have a lot of details. Um, there's, there's these French guys called Michel Ballot and a couple other guys uh, that whose names I can't remember right off the bat. But anyway, they've been doing most of the work in the region uh, recently. And there's some American engineers that were down there building whatever they were building a bridge or something. 
and they were pretty deep out in the jungle. And one of them actually saw the animal come out of the water and, you know, go on land. So that was the last sighting, I believe. That had to be 2018, 2017 maybe it was. I'd have to look it up. I didn't write it down. But um, so it's pretty recent. Okay. So what does this creature look like? So think, uh, so it's got a body about the size of a hippo, kind of a round body, four legs. It's a quadruped. Uh, in fact, uh, it leaves tracks. They're, they're contrary to what skeptics will tell you, they don't look like elephant tracks. They don't look like hippo tracks. They don't look like rhino tracks. They're very kind of specific. They're actually comparable to sauropod tracks for whatever that's worth. So a big body the size of a hippo. It's got a very long, powerful tail, which is what the fishermen actually fear because according to them, it swings its tail back and forth and it gets agitated. And when it gets scared, it's, you know, the boat comes so close. It has a long neck and a small reptilian looking head. So think kind of like Nessie, but a quadruped. So if we were to draw it out like a miniature brontosaurus. Absolutely. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. So when, we're, when you're talking the size of a hippopotamus body, I mean, that's not a big creature. No, but it, you know, 30 feet, maybe altogether. Right. It's not, I think. It, it's a, you know, when, when species come to one environment and then in a very secluded area and aren't found, you know, all over the place when they're endemic to one area, there's something called insular dwarfism where species tend to shrink. So you wouldn't expect this animal to be that huge. Just, and there's a number of reasons for that. Be so it's what happens is usually prey, prey get bigger and predators shrink, which kind of, you know, so you have more of a balance between prey and predator. So, um, and also, obviously, it's easier to stay hidden if you're smaller. You leave less tracks in the environment. And um, so it's not enormous, you know, but it's big enough that, you know, hippo elephant size is a pretty big animal. Okay. So are these creatures only seen in the Congo jungles? I believe so today. In fact, so everyone's focused on a place called Lake Tele, which is in the middle of the Congo. And years ago, when I was going to go down there, that was a place I was going to focus on myself until people from the area told me that they're only there partial, partial months of the year. So I had a hypothesis that perhaps only the female of the species that go to Lake Tele maybe to, to give birth in, you know, during the summer. And also because the sightings there are actually of smaller animals than further uh, north and uh, east, uh, north and east, or with the west, uh, further west, I'm sorry. So, and then they started telling me about these pools of water further in the jungle past Lake Tele where these animals are actually are. And those are places nobody goes to because it's literally, it's just swamp water. It's basically impossible to get there. But little by little, as the years went on, there's less and less sightings in those areas. Like even the pygmies that live in the area used to talk about Mokede Membe and eventually started talking about them less and less. Now it's like my grandfather saw these animals or, you know, my father saw these animals. They don't seem as much. However, sightings started increasing in, uh, in, lower Cameroon and in Gabon. So if you look at the map, there's the Congo and you'll have kind of Cameroon up here and Gabon right beneath it. And there's another area down there. Um, there's a, there's a river called the Ja river that kind of connects the Congo goes up to Cameroon and past a certain point in the Ja river is where people are starting having these sightings of, of these animals. And they're a little bit bigger there than they were in the actual Congo. There's a waterfall there. And that's kind of like usually the last, it's usually the last spot usually people end up going. There's Beyond that, there's poachers that tend to be down there. It's a little, a little more dangerous. But in terms of tribes, there's no tribe. There's nobody that lives past that waterfall. And um, it's obviously hard to get to. But we think that that's where these animals actually are today. And uh, there's been sightings though elsewhere, like in Malaysia, in South America. But like Percy Fawcett, for example, the famous explorer, talked about these animals in South America. But I haven't heard anything recent in, you know, in other in other parts of the world. So are are they aggressive? Yes. And the re and, and the reason why I ask that is, you know, a lot of creatures in Africa are known for their territorialism, their aggressiveness towards anything human. The sound of boats will set them off, you know, literally anything will set them off. Are, are they are they man eaters? Are they are they aggressive towards humans and other animals? They're very aggressive and territorial, according you know to the fishermen and some of the locals and the pygmies. But they're actually they're vegetarian. They uh, their favorite food, against according to you know, 
reports that I got and what other people got is a thing called the Malumbo fruit, which grows on the side of the river. So like I said, these animals are quadruped and spend some time in the jungle, but they're apparently excellent swimmers, including underwater swimmers. And so they use the river systems to get around. And most of the tracks will be found on the side of the rivers. And um, Michel Balot, for example, the explorer I talked about, he's, he showed some pictures of a bunch of tracks kind of going around in a circle and going near the river, you know, where there's some of the Malumbo fruit. So presumably this was a spot where the animals eat. But 100% vegetarian, but extremely territorial and aggressive. And like I was saying, they tend to defend themselves with their tail on the water, at least according to the, you know, to the fishermen. And that's why they tend to not go near these animals. They're very afraid of them. Do they see them more so in the water than in the jungles? Well, nobody goes in the jungles. You know, the only people that go that far, there's... Literally, if you go to Ja River, apparently there's only one little town, you know, pretty far in the jungle, and it's you know obviously it's pretty it's a pretty primitive kind of town. So the only way to really get around is through the river systems, right? To come in and out of those regions. Nobody goes in the jungles because there's really no reason to go in the jungles unless you're hunting for animals, and even then you don't go that far out. It's so impenetrable, and it's so deep, and it's so dark, and it, you know, and like I said, there's no since there's no villages in a lot of those areas, we don't really know. How much time they spend out of the water so pretty much all the sightings have taken place near the river systems how big oh, are the footprints they're about a little bigger than uh, hippo footprints so we're talking you know three four feet across that's pretty big it's pretty big yeah that's pretty big now the fact that this is in the Congo and the Congo is one of those unfortunate countries that always seems to be in civil war and has a lot of tribal factions always fighting. And there's a, there's a big hatred there towards a lot of, you know, construction and, and modernizing the country to bring it up to a 21st century, you know, global type of, of, of country. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's a lot of people who still want to live like it's 1699, to quote Prince's song, right? And that is one of the biggest issues that we see in this. I mean, I have a friend of mine who used to run big heavy-duty cranes, and he was offered like a $200,000 a year job to go run cranes in, in the Congo while yeah. they're building bridges and everything. But, I mean, he had an armed bodyguard service, and, and everything, because at any time you could be hit with mortars or rockets or machine gun fire from from a lot of these these tribal uh, warlords and their armies, you know, and especially if you were white, there was a good chance you weren't going to survive. So that type of political strife really has to play wonders on any type of research regarding this creature. Oh, absolutely. It's tough. Like I told you, I spent two years putting this expedition together until finally the, the production company pulled the plug. Um, I spent two months. I was in Paris for two months waiting to go, waiting for things to kind of come down in the Congo because of the civil war and all that, you know. And luckily, we had some contacts with this uh, police department, perhaps some ex-CIA people out in the region. So we had, we had managed to get a lot of armed guards if we were going to go, you know. And, but the problem with that too is one day your armed guards are your armed guards, the next day they're freedom fighters. You know, it, it changes so quickly down there. And so that's always a concern. And also, the problem with the river system is there's these, uh, I, this is bandits, for lack of a better word, that just kind of travel the river system and, you know, basically shoot on sight. You know, it's not yet, yeah, it's really hard to get money to go because everybody's afraid that you're going to die and you're going to waste their money. Or, you know, so. I mean, we had, we had a right though. We had two uh, Mi-26 helicopters, big helicopters to get around. We had a submersible. We had, you know, and I mean, we had the whole deal. But we're talking, you know, five hundred thousand dollar budget at that point, a million dollars maybe, you know. So it's a huge risk. So, I mean, those French guys are doing fantastic work with very limited resources, but they're also down there doing conservation work, and that's how they're able. You know, to get money and be able to go down to, to, the, to the region. Even then, they're limited to how far they can go in the jungle. Because the other thing, too, at some point, you're going to get sick. You can't, you know, we're not, we can't survive in that environment. You know, what? there's only so much canned food you can bring. There's only so much water you can boil, whatever. At some point, you're going to get sick. You're not going to feel well. And that's been an issue to a lot of these expeditions as well. You can only spend so much time down there safely. 
you know so it would require multiple trips ultimately to do this right and pinpoint a location and again it's you know between the dangers and the wild animals and the disease it's you know it's a tough spot to get to but it's Never, more there's more there's more than looking amendment down there plus the rivers have a lot of dangers to them the rivers are very fast rapidly muddy they have a lot of really strange looking fish i mean if anybody has seen river monsters with jeremy wade that that one fish that has like like tiger's teeth i forget what they call it uh you know it's it's thought to be a man eater you know i mean there's a lot of stuff in those waters that could kill you man i mean basically it's everything wants to kill you you know when you get down there and that's and that's the problem you know so I mean, you look just look at the Congo River. It's the deepest river in the world. A lot of a lot of it, you can't, you know, it, it's so wild, it's so dangerous that, you know, you nobody goes on there. So, it's um, yeah, it's a tough region to get into. And the Jia River again, it's not like anybody really goes up there, so we don't really even know how safe a lot of those areas really are, you know. But um, I still think that getting to the spot is the most dangerous part of the expedition. Once you get out. In the middle of absolutely nowhere, at least you don't have as much of the human problem. You don't have as much, you know, other people with machine guns. Yeah, you have some poachers, but if you don't interfere with them, you don't bug them. You know, they're they're probably not going to bug you. But hopefully, so I think once you get far enough, then all you have is the wildlife you have to worry about and the diseases. You don't have the human factor. Well, but, what kind, when you talk diseases, we're talking things like malaria. Uh, I'm talking like Ebola, or you know. Things we don't even know exist yet, probably. But yeah, malaria, whatever, you know, just anything. You, you can just get sick from from food, you know. There's a lot of people have – the last expedition, I believe, one of the guys had to be helicoptered out at some point. But imagine there's no hospital down there, right? So it, once you're sick, you got to come back until you can go to a place and get a helicopter. So it get you know it gets complicated. But yeah, he was sick, and I think it was just from eating something that's bad, which is usually, I think, the biggest, the biggest problem is food, you know, getting clean food that – Especially for us, right? We're not, we haven't evolved, you know, to eat, mm -hmm. you know, anything that's not, you know, clean, so to speak. You, know? You, so. Know, you know what? You bring up a good point. My, my cousin, who is a doctor, who is a, he's a disease specialist, and he has literally lectured all over the world about infectious diseases, including COVID. And long story short, I remember him telling me right when COVID broke out, uh, he, he reminded me very eloquently as he does. He's like, Dave, he goes, humans are not meant to travel. That's why we are segregated by oceans. So the human body in North America is not prepared for the jungles of Southeast Asia or Africa, and their bodies are not prepared for what goes on in North America. And we forget that because we have this curious nature that we want to see, we want to explore, we want to we want to see these sites that we've only seen on television or in movies, and that's what piques our curiosity of seeing lions in the wild or great white sharks underwater or Mokili Mabembe in the Congo, and that's where we we get into trouble as humans with these yeah. diseases, like you said. I mean, I've been in France where I, you know, I had a friend, an American friend, I got sick just from eating cheese because the body's not used to eating something that's that strong, you know, and smells that strongly, right? So, and, and that's, you know, and that's not that far from what we eat here, but yeah, you're right. We're not used to eating something so, you know, things are foreign to us, especially, and we're talking about, you know, you have to eat, you have to eat, you know, you have to eat food with bugs in them. In the Congo, that's kind of part of the deal. You can't keep your food clean. As, I mean, it's insects all, all the time, you know. So, eh. and sure, so, it sounds disgusting, but that's the least of your problem. The problem is your body's got to be able to digest all that and not, you know. The fact that fishermen are seeing this, yeah. how do we know it's not crocodiles? How do we know it's not snakes like, like uh, giant pythons? How do we know it's not hippopotamuses? Well, generally, you know, for one thing, I tend to respect – usually you know a uh, local population in terms of they know what their animals are this is something so much bigger than a crocodile or a snake and so different from a physiological standpoint that i mean you sort of have to be a complete idiot to mistake an alligator or you know 
Ebola for Mokede and Membe. And, you know, so just from that standpoint, I think it's different enough that you can't mistake it for anything else. And again, doesn't mean it's a dinosaur hybrid. You know, through convergent evolution, you can very well have a mammal that develop traits very similar to dinosaurs or a reptile that can develop traits very similar to a dinosaur, you know. But um, the one thing, though, in 2018, so the dinosaur hypothesis, unfortunately, has kind of been hijacked by a lot of young Earth creationists. Those, that's the group that believe the Earth is 6,000 years old, which obviously is completely ridiculous, you know. And that's kind of – and the problem with that, and it's kind of embarrassed in Mokede and Membe field a little bit. And I'm pretty sensitive to that. And that's part, I think, what a reason I deviate a little bit from the uh, from the dinosaur hypothesis. Also, prior to 2018, there's very few fossils of sauropod dinosaurs in Africa. Now, however, in 2018, they found Mansurosaurus in Egypt, which was uh, a sauropod that the exact same size as Mokede Membe. It looks exactly like Mokede Membe. So that gets a little bit intriguing from that standpoint, you know. So then the hypothesis would be that as Egypt and Northern Africa um, – got drier throughout, you know, throughout the millenniums and all that, the species would have migrated towards the Congo where they found a place of refuge and managed to, you know, survive down there with other endemic species and other prehistoric species like, you know, crocodiles and the longfish. So, you know, that's, that would be the mechanism where the dinosaur's hypothesis would be possible. You know, obviously not because the earth is, you know, 6,000 years old, obviously, but Okay, so the fact that this creature is seen, what, maybe once, twice a year? Uh, at most. Sometimes you don't hear about anything for years. But, again, there's nobody down there looking for it, you know, or there's an expedition every three or four years and nobody, very few people live down there. So what, do, yes. we th what do we think it, uh, it lives off of? In terms of food, you mean? Yes. Well, they're, they're pretty sure it's a vegetarian, so, you know, the Malumbo fruit that's all over the, along the river systems. It's very possible to eat fish, though. You know, you could still be vegetarian and eat fish at the same time as some other animals do it. Vegetation, mostly. So uh, there's a hypothesis that hibernates during the winter. Some people have noticed um, this huge kind of like built-in caves that look like an animal borrowed on the side of some of the river systems. And so some people have hypothesized that perhaps they uh, hibernate during the winter, which reduces, obviously, the load on the uh, on the environment and that and you know it doesn't require as much food year round but i mean there's there's enough vegetation and you know fruits and whatever and for it to survive easily oh definitely so do you think that with 30 seconds to go that there is like a tunnel system that maybe they use because that's the hypothesis for ogopogo and other sea monsters up here no i think it's too big and i don't think it navigates well enough it's too bulky i think to navigate through a tunnel system i think it maybe it, it hides there it hibernates in those tunnels but it doesn't have to it just you know it's such a good swimmer and that's underwater that it stays hidden you know by just by just swimming underwater and then coming out and it goes in a dark forest and there's nobody there anyway so all right alex i'm going to get you right uh, to hold on right there because in hour number two we will bring in questions from our audience and we will continue the talk on Makili Mabembe and other strange dinosaur-like creatures that are allegedly roaming around the world. Do you believe dinosaurs still exist? Does Megalodon still exist? I think Megalodon's out there somewhere. I really do believe so. But we're going to hit them all up with our great guest tonight, Alex Mistretta. Stay tuned. We have more Spaced Out Radio with Hour 2 coming up right after this. All right, brother, we are clear. Cool. Uh-huh. I'm just going to run my dogs outside. I'll be right back, okay? Yeah, no worries. I'm just going to put you on mute here. Be right back, everybody. Hi, gorgeous Alicia. How are you?
All right, brother. I am back. Let me just get my phone plugged in and get you unmuted here if I can find my mouse. There it is. And good evening, gorgeous Kira. How are you? Nice to see you. And who else has joined us? Levi Metzger, welcome to the channel. Thank you so much for taking the time. You know, it feels really good. We got th three of my favorites in here tonight. Rye Guy, Fabster, and Vinny. I know that makes for a good night. Oob to Joe's Maine. Plays a mean mandolin. Love the mandolin. And, uh, yeah, I think that's it. Unless I'm missing some people here. What are you eating there? Look at you, Wheat Thins guy. Hey, there's Not Super Super Ben from uh, UFO Garage. Had a great show before ours tonight. If you haven't signed up for their channel, make sure you do at UFO Garage. They're encroaching on 2,000. Let's see if we can get the Spaced Out Radio crowd to push them over 2,000 followers. If you haven't subscribed already, go to YouTube, uh, go to youtube.com forward slash UFO Garage, and let's make it happen. Let's get our listeners to push them over 2,000 by the end of the night, if you don't mind. Hi, gorgeous, not another Heather, and we're going to get going here in about 10 seconds. Thank you to Jeremy, to Dirty Filth, Adam, and Ed. It's a great way to support this show with Super Chats. Here we go, everyone. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Here we go with our number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears wherever you are on this beautiful planet we call Earth. We want to remind you that you can listen to us on our terrestrial affiliates around North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do me the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Kelter. Kelter is your password. Use it wisely, Space Travelers, as the Clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram. Spaced Out Radio Show. We continue on tonight with Alex Mistretta. We're talking Mokele Mabembe. Is there dinosaurs still living in the heart of Africa? Are there dinosaurs still roaming this planet, flying around, walking around, swimming in our lakes and oceans? Alex, welcome back. Thank you. It's good to have you here. All right. We also, in hour two, like to include some audience questions here, if you don't mind here, man. And uh, let's go to Bombshell Bomber, who is asking, oh, uh, nope, that's, uh, uh, apparently they're starting a band in our chat room, and she's wondering if you if you play any instruments and want to be in the hometown spaced out radio band. No, I sadly, I play no instrument, and I cannot sing at all. It's horrible. I bet you play a mean tambourine or something. For a triangle. There you go. Works for us. Works <laughs> works for us. All right. This this dinosaur, Makili Mabembe, or whatever it may be, uh, is it wrong to call it a dinosaur? No, I mean, you know, it's what it's called. You know, like Mothman's called Mothman. It's not a moth man. You know, it's just it's the term used. I you know, I kind of stand tend to stay away from it because of the stigma associated with it, but that's usually how people refer to it, so I'm, I'm okay with it. All right. So this creature is said to be aggressive, huge footprints that are seen in the mud. Has there any been any video or photographic evidence of this? There's one really crappy picture, which I'm not even sure it's Mokede Membe. It took place in 1992. A Japanese film crew flew over Lake Tele, and it took a picture of, and you know, obviously they're in a plane, so they're pretty up high, of 
you know, it looks like a long body that's walking on the lake. Lake Telly is really shallow. That's walking on the lake with, you know, the neck and kind of long neck and a small head, you know, but I'm not even convinced it's Mokere Membe, but it's, you know, it's a cool photograph, but that's it. Everything else has been fake, you know, so there's, there's a lot of pictures of footprints from expeditions, you know, on, on the, on the river, especially in this place called, uh, uh, I forget the full name of the space. It ends with something Abay, which means B in uh, off the Ja River. There's been a few uh, pictures there of mysterious footprints, huge footprints there, but otherwise not really. Now, are those footprints fresh or are they? They were or... fresh when they took him, when they, when they took him out. Weird. Okay, so with the fact that there are fresh footprints that are being found, I mean, this almost sounds like a Bigfoot type of, of creature that it's allegedly there people have seen it you got to take their word for it there's no video evidence there's no is there audio evidence do we know what it sounds like i there is one uh i think it's a fake though if i'm gonna be honest there's one audio evidence of some guy that claims to have recorded its call it's um but otherwise not really i can tell you what it sounds like though it you know, it's been described sounding like it's this big booming voice that people hear. And that's kind of what the audio sounds like. But it was a questionable individual named Reguster, Re I don't know how to pronounce his last name, that made a lot of claims and not a lot of proof. So it's probably fake. So, no, not, you know, not really. And I, and I, I know what people think. I agree. It's a problem. And it doesn't speak to the veracity of, you know, Mokene Membe. But, again, you kind of have to remember that. It's one expedition every five years, you know, or three years or whatever that goes down there. So, and most of them don't even reach that far out in the jungle. So, okay. So, if we look at the fact that, that let's say it does exist, yeah. Why do we not have any trail cams out there? Why do we not have any uh, video cameras that can be tripped by movement in these so called hotspot areas? To my knowledge, no one's ever tried to set up uh, camera traps in that in in the region. To be honest, so all the expeditions have been from from the ground. Now the Japanese, you know, kind of flew over the place, and the most recent ones have all been, you know, by uh, by a little boat up the Ja River. And to my knowledge, none of them have gotten far enough. I think to start setting up camera traps where the animal allegedly live. You know, I think most of the encounters that we've had so far, and most of the area people have focused on have been part of the animal's range, perhaps when it goes out, you know, looking for food or whatever. I don't think anyone's actually even reached far enough in a jungle yet where these animals would live. So it's something that we talked about, you know, when I was organizing my expedition and this was kind of like, this was what, what year is this? 2021, so fifth, over 15, you know, 15, 17 years ago, whatever. So we didn't quite have the technology we have today in terms of camera trap and all that. So we're talking about filming from the air, but, um. Yeah, something that absolutely needs to be done. But again, it's the problem of getting to, to the spot, you know? Absolutely. And, and I can totally see where you're going with that. Because, I mean, if you can't get there, and it's hard to get there due to the to the tribal factions and and everything that kind of goes along with that, I mean, use it, it's easy to say, why don't we use today's technology? But if you can't get in there, it's hard to get that technology set up. That's what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I you know, I have a plethora of ideas of what we could be doing down there, but we're we're talking about you know setting up using technology to get evidence, but it it's going to require a lot of money because you you know first you have to be on site a minimum of two weeks if you can stay healthy and safe for two weeks or three weeks, right? More than that, you start taking your chances. I think personally, a best chance though is to use um, environmental DNA. So for those that are not aware. I don't know if you guys remember the story a few months ago where the uh, – what's the Bigfoot show that, that was kind of popular with the scientists? Finding Bigfoot? No, not no. <laughs> no, the, the better one. But anyway, um, so they use – you know, they use something – they've been using something called environmental DNA, which means that you can test – it was used on a Yeti expedition in Bhutan also for years ago. It means you can test the water. You can actually test the footprints for DNA. You don't need an actual biological sample anymore. It's called environmental DNA. And they managed to get some, uh, uh, in Bhutan, for example, they got some DNA that says 99.9% .9 human, but not completely human. 
So anyway, the point is, I think our best bet is to use that kind of genetic technology out in the river system, out, you know, if we can find footprints, out where, if you can see bite marks, for example, or whatever, you know, where there's a malumbo fruit or where we think it might be eating. And we might get lucky that way in terms of getting, you know, genetic uh, DNA. I think environmental DNA is brand new. You know, you can even do it through the air now. They're working on you can actually get DNA through the air. It's a brand new technology. It's going to revolutionize what we do in cryptozoology. And I think that, plus you're right, the, the, the camera trap, you know, infrared so you can film through the jungle at night, whatever, light down, whatever you want to use. I think all those things combined is what we really need. But again, that takes expertise. That takes a lot of money. And that takes time. And, uh, you know, all those things have to come together. Has there any for has there ever been any findings of scat? No, not to my knowledge. I I've, I've asked and you know I've looked around and no one to my knowledge has ever reported uh scat or you know anything of that nature. No. So far it's only been footprints and sightings. That's it. Now, the people of the Congo, and, and this kind of leads to Jeff's uh, comment here. Yeah. Would you be all right with people tramping through your land? The people of the Congo, do they want outsiders investigating this creature? They don't seem to really care a whole lot because we're these, because the fishermen hate Mokene Membe because, and they don't have so many encounters anymore, but the problem is, as it was relayed to me, was that it was interfering with their fishing. You know, I didn't, and that's why I didn't like the animals. Same thing with the pygmies. They thought it was a story of the pygmies that set up a trap and actually killed one uh, many years ago because they don't, they don't like these animals because they're aggressive, they're scared of them, and it interferes with their, you know, with their, with their fishing. But again, once you start going in Cameroon, where I was saying the majority, I think, of this species exists, and we start going up the Jaw River, where the sightings are at and where these animals are allegedly at, where I think they're at, nobody lives there. Nobody owns that land. There's no tribes. There's no, at least there's no known people to live there, so they don't really care. You know, it's not like it's not like you're, you know, it, and it's not like Bigfoot where you have to go on a reservation occasionally, right? And it becomes kind of iffy about do you belong there? Should you be there? You know, do you have the right to interfere with you know what belongs to them? Essentially, this is a very different thing where Mokinemembe is so remote and out of the way that nobody down there really objects to you know. And you have to realize the environment too. Their their most concern is day to day survival in a lot of these, you know, in a lot of these areas, you know, so I personally might, I think it would be very beneficial because I think if we can, there's a huge problem of biodiversity loss today, right? If we can see a lot of uh, species going extinct and that affects the hunting for some of these tribes that affects the fishing or whatever, and that affects the environment. It's, it's almost catastrophic in some of these areas most more you know more so in the amazon than the congo but it's a problem down there too and i think if we were able to make discoveries in relation to located membe or the other the other mysterious animals in a region one's called chipekwe and some of the other animals we'd be able to actually preserve the area and actually we'd be able to bring attention to the area and start you know start helping out from an ecological standpoint you know and maybe helping out some of the people down there they're in you know they're they're living under very difficult um, conditions, you know? So I think it would be beneficial, at least for, you know, for uh, for the Congo Basin. Yeah, but you think if this creature were to be proven, that would help out a, a very lacking tourism industry. Yeah, well, obviously, we, that's something that's always the fight. I, I, don't th I think it's too remote and too dangerous for the tourist industry to really, really take hold, you know? And if, if we... I think if you can, you know, and you can isolate the area and, you know, making, so you make it illegal, people actually go down there without a very permit because it be, would become then a, you know, uh, a preserved area, right? To preserve wildlife. At least that would be my goal. So you, you know, you would not let people actually go down there. You wouldn't, you'd say no to tourism. You'd, you know, you'd say no to whatever, you know, it, you'd want to preserve the area because you got to think about it, right? You're looking at a very unusual animal. If it's a dinosaur, it survived 65 million years against all odds. If it's not a dinosaur, whether if it's a mammal or a reptile, it still find very unusual adaptations and it's find ways to stay hidden. It's found ways to survive against all odds, right? And we can learn so much from that and, and help us in terms of saving a lot of, you know, 
species are on the brink of extinction if we can find if we can learn from this animal how it would manage to stay hidden how it managed to survive you know there's so much to learn from it that can help us literally literally save the world as i know that sounds grandiose but i think biodiversity loss it's such an issue with us today that any unknown special mr species that you can find you just something you can learn from them and you can apply that to you know the ecology and the world at large you know and I think I, at least my hope would be that we go in that direction and not so much where woohoo Jurassic Park, you know, let's bring in, you know, the, the fat Americans and and have a hot dog stand and, you know, let them take pictures of Mokele Membe. So give, give Mokele Membe some freedom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I realize that's somewhat idealistic and, and I realize hundred percent that on some level it's an excuse that I have because I want to find it so badly. So there's a selfish aspect to this. 100%. I'm, you know, I'll admit to it, but I firmly believe that we could use these discoveries and what we find in that region, because this is a real lost world, because we're not just talking about Mokene Membe, and we can apply that elsewhere, and I really think it'd be really beneficial to, you know, to the world at large. Okay, so has anybody, whether it's locals, hunters, or even poachers, claimed to have shot this creature? Yeah, um, just uh, the pygmies. The pygmies in their ears. And this was back in the Lake Taylor area. So this is not the Cameroon Ja River area. Claimed to have killed one uh, many, many years ago. Because again, it was interfering with their fishing. So they got pissed off and they built, you know, they built a trap and they killed it and they ate it. And uh as the story is told, now you have to remember in that region, the stories don't get written down. It's all passed through oral tradition, you know, from gen from generation to generation. So this is maybe to see the stories are telling about their grandparents or whatever, right? So that apparently everybody died that actually ate uh, the animal. They were, uh, yeah, I died of poisoning. No kidding. Yeah, at no. least that's the story. You know, yeah. Incredible. Alex Mastretta is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. So, if as we wrap it up on this topic of the conversation, if you were to set up a a team to go into the Congo and and actually look for this creature. What is necessary to do that? What is this in terms? What do you mean in terms of equipment or in terms of equipment, time, time of year, everything? How many well, people would you need? Probably at least. So you'd want um, obviously you'd want you want soldiers, right? Because you want a lot of protection. You need a geneticist. You need a biologist. You need um, a guy that's already been down there, or at least close to it. You, know, you need someone that understands the wildlife and how to navigate, you know, those areas. So, you know, at least 10, 15 people, realistically, you know, and, um, but you would need, I mean, you need, you need a, you know, two, three boats, right? You'd be able to get an area. You need a helicopter. You would need camera traps, infrared. You'd be able to film at night. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even mind. Like originally we had a glider. So you'd have something silent that could fly over the jungle and get night footage, you know, like a drone. Oh, huh? Yeah. Cause ultimately you won't narrow it down. Right. So the first trip you'd go for about two weeks and then you'd probably come back home and you'd have to go back another two weeks or three weeks. And little by little, I think you can start narrowing it down. So we're talking, you know, maybe a million dollars, 15 people. It, you know, it's quite an enterprise. So, is that money still available for topics like this? Because even though it's a sexy topic, there's a big risk that nothing is going to be found for a million dollars. Yeah, it's a huge risk. Agreed. Yeah, there is and there isn't. Like I know I've been in talks three times with private uh, millionaires or billionaires, whatever that were you know that were considering funding you know my work and all that stuff. But every time I have a tendency to kind of you know it doesn't it never really closes. So. There is and there isn't. I think there's interest, but it is such – it's a risk. I mean, but that's that's science. That's exploration. That's research, you know, and I'm afraid that – and I see this, and this is a more of a philosophical topic, but in America, we seem to have lost that sense of exploration, that sense of wonder, you know, and I think a topic like this could be so beneficial to reignite our love of nature, our love of expedition, of, ex, ex, of exploration, of the unknown, you know, that – that we, we lost that by looking at our phones and being on YouTube all day. And, you know, and instead of idolizing nature and being concerned about the world, we idolize politicians, you know? So, and I think 
it's such an important subject, I think, like I said, not just for biodiversity loss, you know, and for the environment, but I think just from a philo philosophical standpoint, I think it's such a worthy enterprise, you know? And I firmly believe, I think for probably a little more than a million dollars ultimately, because of how many trips it would take, five years, five to eight years, I guarantee we would find Mukede Membe. 100%. Or be able to prove that it doesn't exist. Or prove that it exists, yeah. Like I said, obviously, environmental DNA is such a huge, huge goal because if you can, even if you don't find the actual animal, if you go down there and prove that there's this DNA of this unknown animal, you know, whether it's smoke a member or it's the other mysterious animals in the region, the Chipekwe or whatever, it all of a sudden the interest just, you know, just multiplies, right? And you can get more funding and more money and more interest and maybe, you know, better geneticist, better biologist that's going to come along that's going to be interested in the enterprise, you know, and you can start partnering. Then once you start prove there's a biological reality of this animal, you can start having partnership with like ecological causes and people are already down there doing work, you know, and through this partnership, you can, you know, increase your funding and, and the time that you spend down there and, you know, and you get to know, and a lot of people are doing ecological work, for example, they get to know a lot of their locals a lot better. And, you know, it, you get to know the secrets of where to go, where not to go and all that stuff. So, it's not a one expedition deal, realistically, you know, but I think it 100% it can be done. Alex, I know you're not into the woo, okay? You're very anti-woo, and you know that I am very pro-woo, and, you know, because I, I think there are some things that are not explainable that are out there. That being said, my friend, that being said, one of the theories that I have for a lot of these creatures that are being seen, whether it's Makili Babembe or whether it's the Thunderbird, is that we're actually getting visions into a different timeline. Do you think that is possible with this creature? For Makili Babembe, no, because I haven't seen any proof of anything unusual, but I think it's possible for other creatures. For, you know, here's my thing with the stance on the woo, and this is something I think no one really understands. And part of that's my fault because I get pissed off and then I go off. But um, it's not adding the woo that bugs me to a lot of these animals. It's denying the biological, well, we know the evidence that points to biological reality. And they're not mutually exclusive, you know, especially when it comes to Bigfoot. So, for you know, for example, <clears throat> denying human evolution and denying you know, all the traits that Bigfoot resembles, you know, hominids or hominid or different primates, you know, ancestors, whatever, is absolutely ridiculous because all the evidence is there. It doesn't mean that you're not, add, you know, you don't, you can't add the rule on top of that. So my problem is, it's with the negation of, you know, evolutionary biology, not so much of adding to the rule. But going back to Mokere Membe and animals in the region, because we're talking about a region where there's another animal called the Chipekwe, which looks like a, a water rhinoceros with one horn. There's a cat with saber teeth, and there's a small bipedal uh, diminutive Bigfoot type, right? But none of those have any paranormal connotation. There's no tales from the, you know, from any of the population that invoke, well, one day we saw this and it disappeared. You know, everything is very biological. So for those, no. But I think in terms of, you start talking about pterodactyls, for example, and, you know, in North America, there might be a paranormal aspect to it, you know, where, and... We know from, from you know, paranormal studies, right, in going back to the, the, the ghost world, right, where someone will walk in a forest and all of a sudden they'll be in, in a scene from, you know, 200, 300 years ago or medieval times or they'll see something that's there and then it's gone. It's almost like you're seeing a time warp or you're seeing something that happened once upon a time. So it's a, actually if that can happen for people and objects, it could absolutely happen for, uh, you know, animals or prehistoric species or um look at canuck chase there's a place in england called canuck chase and there's a thing called a man monkey and it's uh it's a bigfoot type in this area and there's also a plethora of paranormal uh, modalities that occurs in around canuck shakes including you know tales of dog man or werewolf as they used to call it down there but it's like a phantom type of bigfoot they call him the man monkey obviously the area in england isn't big enough to sustain a living biological population but yet people are seeing these things appear and disappear. But unlike Mokede Membe, for example, you don't have any, any of the, you know, they'll appear and disappear and so forth. So wrap it up. Okay. 
Alex, we're going to get you to hold on right there because we are going to go to break here at the bottom of the hour. One half of the show gone, one half to go. Let's get into pterodactyls, sea monsters, and whatever else we can throw at Alex Mistretta next. All right, we're clear. Cool. Just so you know, ladies, that Alex Mistretta will be walking through the Vegas casinos shirt off when we have our spaced out radio party. Just letting you all know, giving you a warning. He'll be partying with us, minus his shirt. Yeah, I gotta warn you. When when we go to Vancouver Island, I I do Bigfoot shirtless too. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. Looks like the borders may open up uh, July twenty first through twenty seventh. That's what I'm hearing right oh, now. Oh, really? Finally? Yeah. about time man yeah it's too bad i was looking forward to that the the tessa um um conference that we're all gonna have but are you going to that yeah well i was planning to originally i was going to speak there actually but because uh myself and grant cameron are going to be there too yeah yeah brian told me yeah yeah. So yeah, originally I was gonna I was gonna do a talk, but but well, I mean we'll see what happens with COVID and with the, when that happens and all that stuff. So, are you talking with Grant Cameron or just separately, you know? No, uh, Grant Grant Ryan wants Grant and I to come out there to speak uh, as the kind of like the the main guests. Yeah. So that's gonna be cool. That's cool. I, I like Grant a lot. Yeah, I, uh, this is the Tessa Experiencers uh, Support Association Conference. Uh, it's just outside of Toronto, Ontario. I believe it's the first weekend in October. Which will be good. So if anybody wants to join, they come join us. That would be really cool. Mm -hmm. When were you thinking of coming up here, Alex? I don't know. It's uh, originally it was the fall, but the whole you know the whole COVID thing and not working for so long, kind of. Like oh, where God. where on Vancouver Island were you thinking of going? I don't know. I haven't really fully looked into it yet, but I met a I met this guy at a Bigfoot conference a few years ago that lives out there. And he had some interesting areas that he talked about. I was going to try to get back in touch with him and see what he had to say. But yeah, I haven't really laid out the plans yet, you know, because. Dude, you could, you could save a ton of money just by coming up to my place. Yeah. Just go into the forest. I can, I can, we can do that. Yeah. That'd be cool. I can show you where we found prints. Yeah. Where we found uh, tree structures. Well, my buddy Mike has. Yeah. Got everything right here, yeah. side side by sides to get into areas, you know. Yeah, might have, arrange, might have to arrange something. Yeah, show you where we got chased out. Yeah, yeah you're in, uh, you're in a good area, man. Iberata in Singapore wants to know if you know about the Niami Niami in the Zambezi River monster. Do you know about that one? I believe and. I'm not 100%. I think that's a local name for uh, Mokele Membe types, right? But from what I understand, there hasn't been any modern sightings for a while. So oh, I could be wrong. There's so many local names, you know, in Africa, because apparently beforehand, the animal was seen a lot more, a lot more places. So a lot of these countries have yeah. different, different names for it. So I believe that's uh, another name for Mokele Membe, but... I don't know that much about what goes on there today. Yeah, sorry. 
Mm -hmm. Co-create happy. How are you? Yeah, we'll go meet up with uh, Steve Istall. He's only uh, two hours south of me. How many of you guys signed up for UFO Garage? Jeff, Steve, Garvey, how you doing? I want to see if the numbers, have we hit 2,000 there yet? So we're on in like 25 seconds. Oh, come on. They're like just a few short. Just a few short. I think if we had eight people sign up for UFO Garage, that would do it. Let's get them to 2,000 tonight. And uh, thank you to Jeremy, to Dirty Filth, Adam, and Ed for the super chats. Here we go with the second half of the show. Second half of Spaced Out Radio is underway tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for hanging on out with us. We really do appreciate your listening ears wherever you are on this planet we call Earth. We want to remind you that if you've missed portions of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor, hit that subscribe button, our website, is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. we got Alex Mistretta here tonight. We're talking dinosaurs. Are dinosaurs and dinosaur-like creatures still roaming the Earth here on North America? In Europe, Africa, we know Megalodon's out there somewhere. At least I believe. Alex, are you still up on the Megalodon stuff? You believe yeah. he is out there? I think it's possible, but I think more likely it's because uh, there have been sightings, obviously, of giant sharks. Uh, a shark like Megalodon, but it doesn't necessarily have to be Megalodon. I think everybody jumps to the Megalodon thing because everybody knows the name and it's popular. And you know, there's been a movie a few years ago and that whole deal. But Realistically, it could be any, you know, it could be another unknown type of shark that's very similar to a great white or a megalodon. So I believe that it's out there. And there's one incident that I don't think gets enough press is about 10 years ago in Australia, there was a great white shark about 14, 15 feet long that was caught up in the nets. And there, this was all over the news at the time. You can still go back and actually find the clip to this, where there was a bite mark around this great white's neck that was caught in the net. And it started at the spine on one side and went to the spine on the other. One bite. And obviously it killed this great white shark. But they figured it would take a 30 to 40 foot great white in order to make a mouth that size to wrap around that shark's net to go bite it from spine to the other side of the spine. I believe they are out there, man. And maybe they're not megalodon per se, but I do believe that there are some 30 to 40 foot great whites out there who are encroaching on that megalodon size. Uh, yeah. And I, I agree with you. I, you know, they, um, in the South Pacific, they call them Lords of the Deep. These giant white, they're a little bit wider than uh, great whites, according to, you know, sightings anyway. And so they've been seeing him for, you know, for, for generations. I mean, I've heard stories as long as 100 feet, which I think is an exaggeration. It's really hard to estimate, you know, kind of how long something is in the water. But we're so, you know, something at, something at 40 feet would look like, you know, 80 feet, right? If you just, if you're staying there on a boat, it would look, give that impression, be that much bigger because it's such a huge size. I mean, you look at a great white today, right? Maximum size, 20 feet or so. But if you were to guess, if you look at a 20-foot great white while you're in the water on a boat, you would probably guess 30 to 40, you know? So I think there's some exaggeration there. But, you know, that, that's a big bite mark, you know? I remember that incident very well. So, yeah, I think something's out there. Why do you think we're not seeing more of them? 
Uh, they're probably well, megalodon, or you know, if it's another shark similar to megalodon, they, they're deep water um, sharks, you know. And again, we've explored. We know what five percent of the ocean, if you really think about it, right? Officially, it's about five percent. And all the ships have the same shipping lanes, right? You know, people go to you know, people stay close to, to shore to the coast. So it could be they're just out there. We're just not seeing them. I mean, we're you know, what's the deepest ocean? What twelve thousand feet? You know, over two miles deep, there's a lot of room for things to hide. I think, you know, if they're deep water sharks for the most part, they don't, they don't come up to shore all that often. It's probably that would count for us not seeing them, which is a good sign, you know, which is a good sign for us because, you know, we have less of a chance of dying. I know you have a fear of getting bit in half, so. Yes, yes. Or like that scuba diver recently in Cape Cod who got swallowed up accidentally by a humpback and luckily yeah. got spit out. That's yeah. my luck. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you ever hear that story about Jack Cousteau in Djibouti? No, fill me in. So there's a French uh, cryptozoologist. He wrote a book and he was on TV in France. I, Philippe Coudray, I believe his name was. Apparently, heard this story, and this is sort of secondhand, so it's hard to say how true it is. And Cousteau was you know, not always the most honest of individual, for those that don't know. So, but the story was that so Jacques Cousteau went to Djibouti in the Gulf of Tajira, Gube, in the uh, in this place called the Island of the Devil. And uh, they've had stories down there of a gigantic animal that you know kind of lived in a region. So the story goes that like, uh, Cousteau got a camel and put him in the cage. And dumped it in the water and see if you could attract, you know, whatever this predator was. And and they were filming at the same time. And when it pulled the cage back up, and uh, the cage was completely mangled and the animal was gone. And, you know, obviously something had taken it. And according to Coudre, you know, Cousteau had a film and decided not to show it to anybody. And uh, Cousteau, you know, said, that I don't think the world is ready for what's down there. You know, and never talked about it again. So it's an interesting story. I have no idea if it's true or not. But I always find it was kind of really cool, kind of, you know, intriguing story. But it is backed up by, you know, there's been a lot of legends of something living in those waters. So I don't know. Where were those waters again? In Djibouti. It's called the Gulf of Tajira. And the place, it's called Island of the Devil. It's Kublaid al Karab or Karab. I, you know, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce correctly. So Tajira is T A D G O. You are and, a, and, and what is this creature supposed to be? They never give a description, but a lot of Kudre hypothesized that it was a megalodon, and that's what some of the rumors were, or a giant shark. But again, there's no real proof, you know? It's just a story that's that's gone around in the underwater community, so to speak. Right. In Europe, you know, I, no one really heard of it out here in the United States. I happen to speak French, so I, I read Kudre's book and all that, and that's where I found it. But sticking with sea monsters, Nicola is asking, what do you think Champ is? This is from the sea monster at Lake Champlain. Yeah, well, I think Champ is one of the, first of all, it's one of the ones that has some uh, some of the better evidence for it, you know. Obviously, at that point, you sort of have to assume that, I don't like looking at lake monsters as just individual animals in, in just one lake. I like to look at it as a worldwide species. So, you know, you'd have to think if something's able to survive in Champ, it would be similar to what it's something that's in, you know, at Loch Ness, for example, where we're dealing with one type of animal. And I don't know, you know, I know there's a theory that it's an amphibian, you know, and I think that's kind of that's kind of an astute original idea. But I've always leaned towards a uh, mammal personally, which doesn't explain how it can stay hidden so much. But the physiology the physiology and the way it swims and the descriptions that you know it drops in the water and goes up and down, or whatever, to me says mammalian, you know, but to be honest, I don't have a real good handle on what Champ is. It's always kind of, for whatever reason, it's, some, it's just not enough in, information, you know, for me. All right, let's 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 move on here, and we'll get more into sea monsters here a little bit. Uh, Solar Warden has a question for you. Alex, are you familiar with Brooks Agnew? He speaks about a massive ocean under the Atlantic whereby there seems to be an entire set of living Life living in darkness, hidden between two worlds. I'm not familiar with the name. No, um, I do know that I discovered creatures recently at what was it, eight thousand to ten thousand feet, that that are brand new to science. Some of them are literally invisible because they don't, you know, 
they say they have a win and not reflect light, whatever. But um, I I know that, but yeah, I'm not familiar with Brooks uh, Agnew at all, though. All right, well, let's get into other dinosaurs here. One of the ones that bugs me, if we can call it a dinosaur, I don't think we can, is the legend of the Thunderbird. Yeah. Okay, this one bugs me a little bit because with the alleged 40-foot wingspan, this would appear on radar. It's the size of an airplane. It would appear on radar. We'd, I could just imagine the size of its droppings. Yet we don't see any big trees or cars painted white, you know, just from something flying over. This is one of the creatures, like I stated earlier, where I believe people are having the sightings, but maybe they are getting a look back in time or in a different dimension or timeline and seeing this. Yet every year there's reports of people claiming to see a giant Thunderbird in the sky. And it doesn't matter whether you're on the East Coast of the United States, you're on the West Coast, right up to Canada here. It just seems to appear. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It's problematic. And again, it's not one of those I spent a lot of time on. But it does seem to be a pattern of events, right, where there's a lot of sightings in Pennsylvania. Uh, there seems to be a pattern maybe of migration where then there's a lot of sightings in the Midwest and towards Alaska, right, if you start grouping historical sightings. There's always that story right in the 70s in Illinois, the little kid that got picked up by, you know, a, allegedly by a Thunderbird. So I don't know. I agree with you. It's maybe, I think the size maybe is, is, is exaggerated. Like how big, I'm not even sure how big it have to be to, to show up on radar though. Right. Well, there have been alleged rumors that on the East coast that these have appeared on radar right. and then disappeared. Yeah, I mean, if they float low enough, right? Then this will have to be picked up. But then, yeah, you would assume it'd be, it'd be seen more often. I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. I agree with you. It'd it have to be such a small population, I think, for them to stay hidden from that standpoint. But you know, again, if they fly in regions where there's not a big population, I mean, I don't know how much this, how often do people get crapped on by an eagle or, you know, or a condor or right addressing your uh your poop I well I, re I realize that but it, i mean an eagle you're looking at a at a wingspan of for a larger one say around eight feet right okay now if you're looking at a wingspan of 40 feet you're getting into jet fighter territory there yeah okay That's uh you know like if i pull up you know uh what's the wingspan of an F-18 Hornet. The wingspan is 37 feet, 5 inches. Yeah. 56 feet in length. So, I mean, realistically, an F-18 Hornet is the size of these alleged Thunderbirds. Yeah, I mean, yeah, no. I 40 feet seems like an exaggeration to me. You know, even, I mean... I know there's a hypothesis that they're they're living, you know, territories, right? Which was these giant birds that used to live uh, from Argentina to all the way to North America. But I, you know, I think twenty. If we're gonna realistically, I think for a hidden population of birds to exist, I maybe I'd go as far as twenty feet, and I think that'd be large enough to be special, but still small enough to be able to stay hidden. You know, if you start if you reduce it to twenty feet, and you know. If they migrate at night, if they, you know, they live in areas, you know, a little far enough away where most people live, I think they could stay hidden. But I agree with you. Thunderbirds are, are not the most likely to be real biological species, you know, in terms of in terms of all, you know, cryptozoology. But I don't have an answer for you because I don't know. Well, I mean, even you know? if you divided it by two. Yeah. A twenty-foot wingspan. You're still in uh, the size of a of a Cessna. Yeah, right. That can be picked up on radar. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't know why it's not. Picked. I never. I honestly never really thought about the radar thing because I never really looked into it. But it's a problem. I don't know. But it maybe they are picked up on radar. Such so maybe there's such few of them that they are picked up on radar occasionally. Just people just kind of they just ignore it. I mean, 
you know, most radar operators are not real forthcoming when they pick up weird stuff on radar, you know, as, as, as I've learned with the, you know, the UFO thing. So. Right. Okay. Well, let, you know, let's, let's switch over to pterodactyls then or pterosaurs. Okay. Jonathan Whitcomb has done some amazing work with trying to track down these sightings. A lot of them are, are around first nations areas and, and reserves. They tend to go from Mexico into Texas and along the coast of California straight up to northern British Columbia. I don't think they're seen in Alaska. But this is something that they call the Ropin as well, where at night apparently it's seen with, uh, with its chest glowing with a red light, almost like the heart can, can uh, glow through its translucent skin. Green, green light. Or, or green, yeah. And, you know, what do you know about this? Well, the Ropin is usually uh, uh, where they, that's from Papua New Guinea. That's where they call the Ropin. Um, actually, I like the glowing aspect of it. To me, that is actually an indication of being a real animal because here's, here's my hypothesis on that, right? There's, there's owls, for example, in Europe and there's a, in Germany, I forget the type of owl, that likes to sleep in tree trunks. What happens in tree trunks is there's this fluorescent um, fungus that the owl rubs itself in, and when he flies at night, he actually glows. So you can look it up. There's pictures of, it's really rare. There's pictures of these owls at night flying, and they glow. You know, so I think to me that says that we could be having a real animal in Papua New Guinea that during the day spends its time in tree trunks when there's that fungi, and it, you know, it sleeps in there, rubs himself, whatever, and that's why it's seen glowing at night. Or it could be again a diet thing, right? It's eating like we know there's turtles in the areas that exhibit, you know, a green glow, right? They, they were discovered, I think, a few years ago. So to me, that speaks to a real animal, and um, and they're not particularly huge either, you know. So the ropen is there's a lot, there's nothing that's impossible about the ropen. Now we start talking about the bigger pterodactyls in North America. That becomes a little more problematic because you would assume they'd be seen more often if they had a, a breeding population, right? And um, now, on the other hand, you start talking about the Mexican-Texas border, and I received a sighting from there myself just one uh, many years ago. This guy called me up to tell me he uh, he saw pterodactyl on the ground, and he was looking at it. But um, there's there's a huge mountain range, you know, on the other side of Mexico that, again, it's – almost unexplored. It's wild. It's, it's huge. Very few people ever go down there. So if there would be a breeding population pterodactyls or something similar to pterodactyl, again, it doesn't have to be a prehistoric animal. It could be a modern species that through conversion evolution developed traits very, very similar to, you know, uh, an ancient pterodactyl, right? Because that niche, once an animal disappears from nature, that niche is open and nature, you know, as they say, it bores a vacuum and it wants to go and it wants to be filled. That's where convergent evolution comes in. So when it comes to Texas and Mexico, I could see them being a real breeding population. But you're right, we've had sightings in really odd places in major cities and or populated areas, and those are really hard to explain. And that's where you know your idea that perhaps there's like in you know, a time warp or people are seeing something from the past. I I can't completely go against that, but you know, in some of those areas. But I think, as I was saying, I think the Ropen in Papua New Guinea and some of the pterodactyl or pterodactyl-like sightings in Texas, Mexico could be a biological species. Up north in British Columbia, this pterodactyl is said to feed off of humans. Yeah. And it is believed that in a couple of the reservations up north that First Nations people who go missing, namely men, are ha, or have been seen picked up by the claws of this creature and flown way up into the nests high up in the mountains. Yeah. Is that just story, legend, or is it actually happening? I have no idea. I don't know. It's the thing with... You know, it, we're, we're the kind of, this weird dichotomy when we start talking about indigenous stories, right? Because on one hand, they know <laughs> their local creatures a lot better than we do, you know? But also, you look like, for example, you look, and uh, this is also sort of my problem with some of the indigenous uh, stories about Bigfoot that borders on the, on the paranormal, is that 
they also have paranormal stories about the wolf, you know, but yeah, we know that the wolf is a real biological animal, right? Yet it features in a lot of these uh, semi-mythological stories. So with the pterodactyl in British Columbia, I don't know. I haven't personally looked into it. And I've heard other people allude to the story you just told me. I don't know enough about him. But I know there's similar stories in other parts of the world. There's the Orang Bati in Saram, for example, where it's described as more uh, reddish kind of fur. And it also goes and picks up people and, you know, and eats people or whatever. So it's not, those stories aren't just, you know, from British Columbia Native American. So I don't know, you know. What do you think this creature is feeding off of? Animals, deer, fish? Um, in Papua New Guinea, because it's seen so often, for example, flowing, you know, flying over like the water, like, uh, probably fish, maybe, you know, sea turtles, whatever. So if it's a pterodactyl or it's a modern species resembling a pterodactyl, it's a reptile, right? So you sort of have to look into what reptiles tend to eat. You know, so they're... Yeah, it could be, you know, meat. So, you know, if it's a small one, right, you know, reptiles, well, I can snakes and eat a mouse or, but something much bigger can certainly can, you know, can feed on, on, on you, Dave. A lot of meat there. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> a lot of meat there. Alex, we got three and a half minutes before okay. we got to go to break. At the top of the hour, our guest tonight, Alex Mistretta, we're talking pterodactyls. Now, the pterodactyls that are seen in Texas and even up here to BC, are like right out of the book. They got the bony head yeah. that protrudes from the back of the skull with the long beak. You know, we in see it too. Pardon me? In New Guinea as well. You get that description with the... Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so if they are being seen, how do we know people aren't misinterpreting this for, say, a vulture or a condor? I, I'm sure it happens from time to time. But once you start talking about animal, because, you know, the description is like the guy that the guy that saw it told me it was only a few feet away and he saw it on the ground, you know. And the description that comes over and over again is the having no feathers, right? It's like hairless type of animal. So we're either dealing with, you know, with a gigantic bat, which doesn't quite have explained the facial features of a pterodactyl-like, or we're dealing with either a new type of flying reptile or a prehistoric type of reptile, you know, or... Are people, you know, and I mean, I don't know how much misidentification could account for all the sightings. I don't know. You know, I don't know what the, I don't know what the math is right there. It's not like we're seeing, you know, it's not, it's not like we're seeing pterodactyls every week, like people like Bigfoot, you know? So it, it does leave room for the possibility that it doesn't actually exist. But, what about, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, no, I'm sorry. But, you know, there's enough there. There's enough meat there that it's interesting. You know, I actually I tried to have a New Guinea expedition a few years ago. We we're almost on board, and then you know, kind of same story. People backed out, and they never ended up going. Right with 90 seconds to go, race fan is asking, "What's your opinion on these people or who, who are having mini T Rex sightings?" Okay, so there's three different areas we're talking about if we're talking about an animal like a T-Rex, right? So there's sightings in Australia. It's called a Burunhor or Burunjor. Again, my pronunciation is terrible. I never know how to pronounce some of these things. But um, who's, who's supposedly very T-Rex-like. And um, again, being T-Rex-like doesn't mean it's a T-Rex, obviously. that's Having T-Rex survive to this day, it's a little bit of a stretch, but... Um, the possibility that we're talking about a reptile in Australia that, you know, that's bi partly bipedal. We know ancient reptiles were by could have been bipedal. We know they discovered a crocodile that used to be, used to walk on two feet, you know. So that possibility of a modern adaptation or vestigial adaptation showing up in a modern population, even of an unknown species, is a possibility. Or, you know, Australia is a weird, Australia is a weird place, though, man. There's a lot of weird shit that goes on in the middle when there's nobody at. You know, I had a guide years ago and I couldn't get the money together that where it's going to take me out there and tell show me a lot of, a lot of the weird stuff that was going on down there. Wouldn't exactly tell me everything, but, um, the, uh, the T-Rex thing was one of them. It's like people were actually seeing him. So I don't know what to make of it because I haven't been down there. Now what's more interesting is the other two areas. So we have the four corners area. I'm, yeah. I'm going to get you to hold on because we're going to finish this conversation. 
when we come back. Miniature uh, Tyrannosaurus Rexes. Miniature raptors running around the deserts of the southwestern United States. Is it happening? We'll find out. Alex Mistretta is our guest tonight. We got him for another 30 minutes here on Spaced Out Radio. We'll be back. All right, buddy. I'm going to just run my dog, so I'll be right back, okay? All right.
All right, buddy. I'm back. Let's get you up here. All right. We got about a minute and a half here. Okay. <sighs> hey, Jazz, how you doing? Nice to see you. When we get to the final break, just hang on during the break, and then I'll say a proper goodbye to you uh, when we come back. Okay. You follow, just how you doing, man? Thank you for joining us. Dave's left eye is so lazy it collects unemployment. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Big thank you to Magnus, to Jeremy, to Dirty Filth, Adam, and Ed for the Super Chats. It's a great way to support what we do on this show on a nightly basis. And here we go, everyone. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Here we go at the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. We really do appreciate earning your listening ears. We want to say hello to everyone listening in on our terrestrial affiliates around North America, digitally on TalkStream Live, Revolution Radio, and KPNL. All of our archives are free by going to youtube.com forward slash spaced out radio. Just do old baby the favor, hit that subscribe button. The Desert Clam has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Kelter. Kelter is your password. Use it wisely, space travelers, as the clam sets the password each and every night right here on Spaced Out Radio. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Spaced Out Radio Show. For the final time tonight, we introduce Alex Mistretta, the paranormal man of mystery, is talking dinosaurs. And right before the break, you wanted to give three points to a lot of these miniature dinosaurs that people are claiming to see, like miniature Tyrannosaurus rexes. Alex, welcome back. Yeah, so um, I would say more accurate description would be more like looking like a mini raptor type of thing. So I already kind of covered the one in Australia, which is a little bit different. It's a little bit of a bigger animal, allegedly. So, um, but there's two other areas that are always been kind of interesting to me. It's the Four Corners area right here in, you know, in uh, North America. And they're called the river dinos, where these uh, kind of a small raptor bipedal-like creatures have allegedly been seen, especially in Colorado. And, um, and uh, we'll get back to that. And the second place is in the Atacama uh, Desert in uh, Chile. And they're called the Arica Monster down there. And people have mentioned that they look a little bit like Dromosaurus uh, dinosaurs, which which are theropods, meaning that um, in all likelihood they they uh, they have commonalities with modern uh, birds like uh, ostriches and and other uh, non-flight birds, right? Because again, in all likelihood, uh, dinosaurs, theropods, and modern birds share common ancestors, and birds actually are actually modern dinosaurs. So, which brings me back to these two type of animals have been described as raptors. A lot of the People have mentioned raptors, especially after Jurassic Park became so popular, right? And um, but if you look at the description, they could just as well be uh, featherless birds, for example, right? For if it became advantageous in a desert environment, such as you know the Colorado near the Four Corners area, or in a, uh, in Chile in the Atacama Desert, 
to lose your feathers for whatever reason, you know. Um, I could see those being just birds and not actual, you know, dinosaurs. If we're gonna have to go with something that's more likely than the other, that would kind of be my hypothesis to, you know, to go with. But I, you know, it, I don't know. We're talking, we're not talking the most remote. I mean, well, Chile's pretty remote, but the Four Corners area, we're not talking exactly, this isn't like, you know, the Congo in the middle of the jungle. So you have to start wondering how can an animal like this stay hidden? Well, that's that's the big thing. Right. We, we don't know, but yet people continue to see these mini raptors running around, you know? They, they tend to see the, you know, like you said, in the four corners there, which, te te what is that, Texas, Oklahoma? It's New Mexico, Colorado? Yeah, those four. You know, what do these little raptor beings look like? Yeah, they just look, I mean, just look at Jurassic Park, and they literally look like those, um, like, they're really, they really look like mini raptors. But there's not that many. It's not like we have a plethora of descriptions to go with. There's only a handful of, you know, sightings occasionally. The the one in Chile is a little more interesting because there's a lot more up-close sightings, and they're a little more numerous that, that I'm aware of. And that one does seem a little more bird-like than, you know, than the one in the four-corner area. So that's why I kind of have to go with, you know, a undiscovered species of flightless birds, perhaps one that lost its feathers for whatever reason. But, um... Yeah, and you know it. It's hard because, you know, cult, culture, and pop culture is so influential in in cryptozoology. If you think about it, right, a lot of these raptor descriptions came about after Jurassic Park was so popular. Because not that it, I'm not saying not that the, these animals didn't exist prior to that, but I think our descriptions and the traits that we notice and then report to you know to people are very much based on things that are in our head and things that we have seen culturally. You know, so those traits tend to be emphasized. So how much do they really look like, you know, like raptors in the movies? I, I don't know. You know, it's it's the descriptions and it isn't necessarily what the animal really is or looks like. So, you know, I couldn't tell you if it's a bird or a dinosaur for real. For sure. I mean, how often are these seen? I, I'm not entirely sure. River dinos, not that often. I mean, I, I don't even know of any, you know, modern sightings. I know the uh, the Eureka monster in Chile is seen a little more often, so I I know there's been some recent sightings that I remember reading about, but river dinos I haven't heard anything in quite a few years to be honest. But so, but again, you know, it, even that area, if you go to Colorado, where it seems to have more sightings have occurred in Colorado, you're still talking about areas that very few people venture out into, you know, and not all that often. There's enough areas for small populations to hang out in that they wouldn't really necessarily encounter that many people. And again, and the other thing we have to take into account is let's say somebody sees something that looks like a raptor. What's the percentage of those sightings that are going to become public? You know? So like, I mean, I'm 1%, 20%, 50%. I, you know, there's no way to really determine what that number is. So it's really hard to say how many sightings have been and how often without knowing what percentage of sightings that we're not, you know, or not going public or we're not hearing about. And that's always a problem with, I think, all things cryptozoology. Okay. Well, let's go back to sea monsters for, for a second here, because when we look at sea monsters, wh whether like at the beginning of the show where we talked about Ogopogo, we talked a little mm -hmm. bit about Champ or, or the Loch Ness monster, it, is there a greater chance that these dinosaur-like creatures are still swimming in the waters of lakes and inlets around the world. I think it depends on the problem you have now. It's just like, what? It's got to be over 100 lakes that have reported monsters in them, right? They can't all be true. And, I mean, there's even one right here in California, Lake Elsinore, which, you know, I heard sighting. There's sightings of a Loch Ness type, so... Uh, I went down there, and it's, it's obviously there's absolutely no way in hell anything's living in that you know in that lake. It's shallow and it's not that big. But so there's a lot of a lot of these things don't actually exist. And again, when we start dealing with water monsters, you have to pay very close attention to the kind of descriptions you're getting. Because at Loch Ness, everyone thinks of the long neck and the small hat, you know, kind of like like a plesiosaur, you know, type animal. Part of that was based on some of the earlier pictures, which one of them turned out to be hoax. But the majority of sightings aren't really that. Majority of sightings are just a, 
a big, big animal mass that kind of pops up and then sinks, you know, pops up and sinks. It's not really the long neck and small head isn't really described that often, unless you take into account the 1933 sightings on the road where these things, you know, where someone claimed to have seen one on the side on the road or on the side of the lake, which is something that's actually more common than people think. There's a, one of my favorite is the Patagonian Plesiosaur, as it's called. So Patagonia is, a, is, in a, is in Argentina. And there's been sightings along the river systems deep in a jungle there of Loch Ness type animals or the traditional Loch Ness motif. So the body, you know, the long neck and the small head. And there's a biologist that told this story that had these sightings many, many years ago. But he saw them resting on a rock. And he says they're pretty small, you know. And they seem to be behaving like seals. And that's why it kind of gave me the idea that we might be talking about the ones that are more plesiosaur like are actually mammals. So we could be talking about long neck pinnipeds, long neck seals. Uh, you're looking at something like Ogopogo, for example. It's very similar to Caddy, which is interesting. It's a very similar area, right? You could, you could have used a river system to get in and out at some point. You're stuck in a lake. Looks very could look very much like a Zulodon, right? I know that's a prevailing theory of a primitive whale that were very much elongated. Um, you mentioned a sturgeon. I really think that a lot of these lakes are actually sturgeon that people are seeing or catfish even. People underestimate how big and strange these animals are in real life. So I think to answer your question, there's a lot of different animals that can make up the lake monster uh, modality, you know? What would be the chances of it actually being a true sea serpent? You know, I mean, what like a, maybe a and I'm going to throw this out there because I know there hasn't been one found, but what about a freshwater or fish? I think or, or fish behave very, I mean, they're very stiff. They don't, you know, they don't, they're not particularly dynamic. I'd be, and they're pretty skinny. I'd be surprised if we're dealing with or fish. I think it'd be more likely that it would be a giant, giant eel in some instances, more than an or fish. If you're going to go in that, in that direction, you know, I think that's possible. I mean, even we know Loch Ness has eels, you know. So I remember there's a footage from was it two, three years ago of, you know, this kind of, they talk about, I mean, we have a little Loch Ness monster in film. And, it very, you know, it looked to me like like it was an eel. You know, and it's, there's always the possibility that, that what we have is a composite of different animals people are seeing. And then put all, and you put all the sightings together, you know, the eel, so you have the elongated, you know, you have the sturgeon, you know, you have the size. And people kind of put put them all together as one animal, and that turns out to be, you know, what becomes a mythical Loch Ness monster, for example. You know, so I think there's a lot of possibilities with lake monsters. What's interesting, though, is the sea monsters, aside from uh, Cadbazaurus, you know, near uh, British Columbia, which is sighted all the way up to Alaska. And in the 1950s, in fact, they're actually sightings all the way up to Southern California, which doesn't exist anymore. And that one still seems to be pretty prevalent, you know, but the historically a lot of sea monsters that are seen around Scandinavia, which today is a really rich area of lake monster reports, but you rarely hear of reports in the ocean anymore. Around England, for example, there used to be a lot of sightings right back in the 1800s, right? You don't really hear stories anymore. Um, again, yeah, Scandinavia probably, a lot of these animals, if they existed, are probably extinct. So what you could have in lakes like Loch Ness or more in, in Scotland or the Scandinavian lakes, which to me is some of the better evidence, might be the last remnants of these sea animals that got trapped in lakes ultimately. And, you know, because then they, if, then they evolved in a finite environment. So through insular dwarfism, you know, they shrunk a little bit. So, you know, the great sea, sea serpents of old just shrunk and now I both survive, you know, on, in some of these very deep lakes. So I think that's a possibility. Very interesting. Very interesting indeed. Uh, but, you know, what would they be feeding off of? Would they be feeding off of fish? Would they be feeding off of microorganisms, seaweed, kelp type of, of food? I think most likely fish, right? You have to assume with uh, animals that big, it needs a pretty, it needs a certain amount of food, a certain amount of supplements. So you, I don't know if vegetation would be enough. And that's where it, and that's where it gets interesting because, that's where you start, you start looking at the fish population in these lakes. There's enough food of a food source to sustain a living population of something that large, you know? So, and that's always, and that's weird because, I, you know, I've looked up 
I've looked up some reports on that and some, you know, some uh, scientists talking about it. And you get like both ends of the spectrum. Some say no, some say there's plenty of food. So it's, you know, it's really hard to say. And again, it all depends. I'm without knowing what kind of animal you're dealing with. It's really hard to be able to tell how much food source does it need, you know, and what it eats. But my guess would be, you know, fish. If, I mean, some of these lakes are huge, you know. I mean, they're like little, little you know, little seas. So there's probably plenty of room and plenty of food, presumably. Very true. Let's get to a question from Spanish Fly here. With the catastrophic climate changed already affecting migration patterns of many species, do you think this will push creatures into more human populated areas? That doesn't seem to be the trend. I think you get individual creatures that, you'll, that, that you've noticed that tend to venture closer. Like a story about the story about a leopard that came into town and became friends of a cow. I don't know if you guys saw that on TV, but the leopard started coming, coming closer to civilization and, and they found out that and Natty was visiting this one cow. But uh, so I think individuals maybe, but I haven't noticed a trend where an entire you know species would be coming closer to humanity. I think there's still enough room out there. I think uh, if species shrink, it, I don't think we're not going to see them more. They're not going to come closer. But also, and I just lost my train of thought. I forgot what I was going to say. I'm sure it was very profound though. But um. Yeah, I'm sorry. I totally forgot what I was about to get to. My apologies. That That's quite okay. So, oh, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Dave. But um, also, there's, but there's been a trend where more and more people living in cities too, right? There's less and less people actually living in the countryside or in the jungles or in the woods, if you look at the trend, you know? Mostly, you know, people come into cities looking for jobs. So, there's, I think there's less and less people actually close – out close to nature, you know? So I think, and from that standpoint, sightings would be declining as well because I don't think we're out there quite as much. All right. We got seven minutes left with you tonight and it would be remiss of us if we didn't have a quick talk about Sasquatch and Dogman. Let's start out with Dogman uh, because this is a creature that seems to be, you know, the house cat of the wild forest where it's just pissed off about everything. You know, we're in my opinion, and I could be wrong on this, but over the last year or so, it seems to me the dogman sightings are really going down comparatively to Bigfoot sightings. Have you noticed that trend too? I don't know if they've gone down. I think there's been an increase in Bigfoot sightings, but I tend to think it's because of the popularity of the TV shows. More people are coming out with their stories of Bigfoot because it's more socially acceptable now, I think certain level right and there's more interest in the phenomena so i think that is kind of skewed because i don't see so 10 15 years ago you barely heard of dogman right then the whole thing like completely exploded and you had all these signs all over the place so i think it kind of reached its peak of interest and maybe i think people are reporting it less and the average person let's say the average person has seen a bigfoot and sees a dogman right on the, on the weekend they're more likely going to talk about bigfoot than dogman because it seems so crazy even compared to Bigfoot. So I think that data might be skewed somewhat. Okay. So for people who may not know in Radio Land what a dog man is, let's explain what it is. So, all right. Somebody knows kind of what Bigfoot is, right? Where, um, so dog man is, in some ways, it's a canine version of Bigfoot, which, so biologically speaking, dog man is impossible because of the bone structure of, you know, wolves, dogs the kind of family, it would be absolutely impossible for an animal like that to be bipedal. And that's where dogman really differentiates from Bigfoot, where Bigfoot could be, you know, all traits and aspects of Bigfoot, regardless of whether there's paranormal attributes added on, can be explained with this relation to biology. With a dogman, you really can't. So you're looking, essentially you're looking at a werewolf, is what people are describing out in the woods. Or at least that's what they're comparing it to. Okay, and, and it seems to have a little bit more of a a vicious connotation to it rather than the docile uh, attitude that most Sasquatch seem to have. Yeah, it's bizarre. You know, I've I've had a f even though that said though I've had a few personal stories. You know, people have told me of Sasquatch being very aggressive and actually killing people. But yeah, it seems the dogma is definitely more territorial and and aggressive from a, from that standpoint. 
So, which, you know, I would indicate as something very different from, uh, from Sasquatch. Now, that said, I had somebody, an ex, I may have mentioned this on the show before, an ex NSA person uh, that approached me some years ago and uh, about doing some work. And anyway, and I'm going nowhere, but because um, some a couple people ruined it. But, and that person I mentioned the possibility, and I couldn't quite tell if it was a question they're asking me or there was something that they knew. That they, you know, they mentioned what if, what do you think the, of the idea that Dogman is actually related to Bigfoot, but it's been genetically manipulated by the U.S. government by you know an outside party, you know? So from that standpoint, it wouldn't really be a dog. It was just you know, I think some of the, the ears and the muzzle reminds people of a dog, but it could be something a little quite different, you know, could be related to Bigfoot. That's just something that was brought up to me. I don't know, you know, so I just thought it was interesting to get out there though. Right. Because with CRISPR, with CRISPR technology today, that is absolutely 100% possible. We can mix and match, you know, traits from different animals. We can, you know, in fact, we could we could create our own Bigfoot if we really wanted to, you know, and if we mix, you know, champ gorilla genes of human genes the technology is there to do it obviously people aren't doing it because for you know a variety of you know of obvious reasons but the technology is absolutely there to create this chimeras and that creates a whole other aspect to some of these stories like dog man you know no i get you and, and i can i can see that and uh, but for for the difference between bigfoot and and dog man are we seeing any territorial batter, battles between these creatures? I don't know. They, they, you know, there's not enough sightings for me to be able to, be able to determine if they're living in the same area. You would think that if they were, there certainly would be conflict because you're talking about two, you know, big alpha type animals, you know, territorial with, you know, both presumably omnivores, so they would be fighting for resources. But again, there's certain geographical areas of dogman sightings as well, right? There's there's more sightings in Kentucky, uh, Upper Michigan, for example, you know. So, but there's also a lot of Bigfoot sightings in Upper Michigan. So I don't know what the answer to that is. I don't think there's enough data on that, you know. I would love to see that brawl, man. I'm 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 dead serious. That is one brawl. That I totally, totally want to see. Yeah, could you imagine if you came back with that film? <laughs> oh, that is literally, you know, one of the one of the great highlights that I would say could happen here, man. I would love to see it. Love to see it. And I don't know if um, I don't know if it's possible, but I'll tell you, I would be. I would be very, very interested in seeing that. I, I want pay per view for that one, Alex. <laughs> you to, can charge. You can charge a lot of money for that one. Oh yeah, oh yeah. We have about ninety seconds to go here. Uh, your final thoughts on hunting cryptids? Um, I don't know if I have one major over, but I think all cryptids are. I think you know very different and take different approaches, but I think. I think like I was saying earlier, I think the most important thing is that we got to look at it from an ecological standpoint, you know, in terms of how finding these animals can help us with biodiversity loss or how they can help us or that can help the people that live in those areas, you know, and how maybe they can revive, you know, our sense of wonder and revive our spirit of exploration that, you know, we seem to have lost, you know, especially here in the United States. So I think... It's not just a vanity project. These aren't monsters. You know, these represent much bigger, much bigger ideals. And I think they can literally make the world a better place. I think if we, you know, treat cryptozoology seriously and with, you know, with respect. Well, I don't know if there's much of that in the paranormal world, but uh, we'll end it with this. Kim Jellin says, "Groovy eyewear, Alex." <laughs> I wrote especially for Dave. I appreciate that, Alex. We're going to do this again very, very soon. Good luck in all your searches. Don't go get eaten by any great whites while you're surfing on the California coastline because we kind of like you around here. Uh, I'm going to take you to water one day. Nope. Not going to happen. <laughs> Not going to happen. Alex Mistretta, everybody. 
real live dinosaurs and cryptids. He's a good friend of this show. We'll definitely bring him back soon. Coming up next, we have the SOR Newswire and the Thought of the Day. Stay tuned. Spaced Out Radio continues after this. Great show, buddy. Good to have you back. Yeah, thanks, man. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, we appreciate you, man. We appreciate you a lot around here, and and uh, it's good to have you back with us. Well, I mean, you know, you're one of the few that kind of honestly kind of lets me say what I want to say and kind of caters to my strength. You know, I don't have to, to talk about things I don't, I don't know anything about, like, you know. So oh, very I, true. So, so that's very nice. true. That's nice. I never understood, you know, when people have you on and they want to talk about anything else but what you do. Yeah, what do you do? What do you do again? <laughs> yeah, right. Who are you? You know, I gave one one friend of mine crap because his first question on every podcast that he did uh, was, who are you? Tell me about you. Yeah. And I said to him, I said, why are you doing that? He goes, well, I'm trying to catch the guest off guard. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, no. I said, don't be an asshole. You know? Don't be an asshole. That person has volunteered their time for you. Treat them with respect. Yeah. You know? And he's like, yeah, I guess you're right. I said, I know I'm right. I've done over 1,500 shows. Fuck. Just listen to me. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. I may not know much, but the radio game, I know. Alan Hold, how are you? Good to see you. Well, Alex, I'm going to go get ready for the news here. Okay. And I'm gonna we really appreciate you, buddy. All right. Thanks, everybody, for, for listening. I appreciate it. Take care, bro. All right. See you. Bye. Bye. Alex Mistretta, everyone. Mm hmm. Hi, Eva. Thank you, Spanish Fly. Appreciate that, man. Where'd you get your biology degree? Oh, that's that's just not nice, Fap. That's just not fat, nice. Dave went surfing and a great white couldn't fit his jaws around him to get a bite. That's not nice. I mean, literally, you you were like a lollipop for a great white. Can't even get your head in its mouth. Mr. Cowley, welcome back to the show. Oh, Mr. Cowley loves his spaced out radio. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Not another Heather. Um, so what are implying about twins? Who has twins? Wow. You're an Aggie. Spanish fly is an Aggie. Does anybody really know what an Aggie is? I got to look that up. What is an Aggie? Derived from agricultural and mechanical comedy associated with the universities. Oh, there were 20,229 Texas Aggies who served in World War II. Very cool. Very cool. Mystic Walk, how you doing? Got you, Spanish fly. Thank you. 
Oh, Fap. We love you just the way you are. And thank you for that super chat, man. Appreciate you. Appreciate. You. Are you having a good day, buddy? Stay a little bit better or are you or are you still struggling today? What the hell does this mean? If Dave goes swimming in a lake at night and gets eaten by a crocodile, is that breakfast for dinner? Thank goodness we are 10 seconds away. Thank you, Fap, Ozzy, Steve, Magnus, Jeremy, Dirty Filth, Adam, and Ed for the amazing super chats. Really do appreciate that. Here we go. We've rounded third. We're heading for home tonight on Spaced Out Radio. My name is Dave Scott. Thank you so much for joining us. Really do appreciate earning your listening ears. Want to remind you that if you've missed most of this show or others, check out our free archives by going to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me the favor. Hit that subscribe. Subscribe button. That's the button I'm looking for. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you, including rocking out to Bumblefoot and reading up on Captain Shirk's SOR Newswire. Follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram, Spaced Out Radio Show. Speaking of the news. The news is always changing, where we get to the SOR Newswire at the back end of every show, where we get to the weird, the strange, the wacky, and sometimes the oddball. You know, last week, the New York Post came out and said, we don't believe in aliens. It's all a bunch of crap. It's a bunch of lunacy. We don't believe Lou Elizondo. We don't believe anything. And yet today, they come out with a new UFO story. The majority of, of Americans believe in aliens, and we really do think they come in peace. According to a Pew Research study, about 65% of people say they think there is intelligent alien life on other planets, and even stronger majority of about 87% say they don't believe UFOs are a security threat at all, only or only represent a minor one. Americans under 30 years old and men are just two groups most inclined to believe in extraterrestrial life. In June 2021, the Pentagon released a highly anticipated report stating that 144 UFO sightings had been reported by government sources since 2004. Only one of those sightings was identified with high confidence. The country's fascination and the government's investigation into aliens is nothing new. Project Blue Book was an official government program established in 1948 to investigate the reports of UFOs. The reports were archived and eventually made available to the public under the Freedom of Information Act. They claimed that the program investigated 12,618 reported UFO sightings, establishing that 701 of them remain unidentified. Even in 1997, from a CNN Time poll, found that 80% of Americans thought that the government was hiding knowledge of the existence of extraterrestrial life forms. The report was released 50 years after the Roswell incident, which made Area 51 popular. Though Area 51 was established in 1955, the mystery began sometime in the 80s when a man claiming to have been employed there said he saw scientists engineer an alien aircraft, which some believe was modeled after a UFO that had crashed in Roswell in 1947. The man's story was later proven false, as it was discovered that an alleged air, alien saucer turned out to be an advanced weather balloon, but that's not dissuaded Americans from believing in otherworldly neighbors. you think they could remember the name Bob Lazar, and Bob Lazar's story hasn't been disproven. Hmm. In 2019, 
Facebook event called Storm Area 51 that can't stop all of us had nearly 365,000 confirmed attendees and some 384,000 interested in the mission to see them aliens. The Facebook event uh, has since been taken down. And while the Roswell UFO Fest has moved online due to COVID, despite much resistance, the annual otherworldly other event resumed just last week in honor of the extraterrestrial holy ground. The site of a supposed UFO crash in 1947 draws thousands each year. Americans are believing they are. All right, let's get to some fun facts here. NASA's Ingenuity helicopter soars 2,000 feet through Martian atmosphere in its ninth successful test flight. The aerial trooper set new records for speed and distance, as well as stretched the capabilities of its navigation system. Yes, Ingenuity is the little robot that could and the in little engine that could. Isn't that right? And uh, yeah, on July 5th, Ingenuity flew for 166.4 seconds, long enough to transverse or traverse a total distance of 2,050 feet. Ingenuity even broke its speed record by clocking in at 15 feet per second, the equivalent of a brisk run, according to Eric Berger for Ars Technica. The flight was a landmark for Ingenuity. Previously, the gravity-defying Gizmo had stayed course to its mothership, NASA's Perseverance rover, flying a short distance ahead, then waiting for the heftier landbound companion to catch up. In its ninth flight, Ingenuity leveled up from an companion uh, role to a solar mission, and it flew over the Sandy Satea terrain where no rover has gone nor can go before. Satea translates to admits in the sand in the Navajo language of Diné Bazad, and the terrain is exactly as its name describes. The un undulating sands and high slopes covering this stretch of land would hamper any wheeled vehicle daring to cross, but not a flying one. So on July 5th, Ingenuity took a shortcut straight across the Cité uh, towards a safer plane in the south. Along the way, it snapped close-up images of Cité's terrain for further scientific study. Ingenuity's latest flight demonstrates the benefits of having an aerial vehicle around. It can work with perseverance to divide and conquer different types of Martian terrains to cover more ground. A successful flight would be a powerful demonstration of the capability that an aerial vehicle and only an aerial vehicle can bring to bear in the context of Mars exploration, traveling quickly across otherwise untraversable terrain while scouting for interesting scientific targets. Namely, eh, what about them aliens? What about them aliens? Oh, well. Here's a weird one. Six-year-old Jane Blasio was playing in her backyard one afternoon when her life was upended. Her father, Jim, asked her to come indoors because he wanted to tell her something. The Akron, Ohio resident ran inside to find Jim puffing on a cigarette. We have something to tell you, and it may be hard for you to understand, he said to Blasio and her sister, Michelle, who was 11 and sitting at the kitchen table. As he fumbled for words, Joan, the girl's mother, announced, you two were adopted. Do you know what that means? In that instant, Blasio had little interest in understanding what being adopted actually meant, but the incident in 1971 planted a seed that eventually consumed her life. It's like that moment was burned into me, the 56-year-old federal law enforcement officer says. Blasio's decades-long search to find her birth parents ended up exposing how a small-town Georgia abortion doctor named Thomas Hicks ran an illicit baby-selling operation that flourished during the 1950s and 60s. During her quest for answers, Blasio not only learned that she was one of 200 children sold in the back alley behind the clinic, but she soon went to work helping dozens of non-grown or now-grown infants, known as Hicks babies, track down their birth parents and other relatives. My father knew that the Hicks actions were illegal, but my mother just wanted a baby and didn't want to know anything. So my dad was going to do whatever he would to make her happy, says Blasio, who writes about her search to uncover her past and her new memoir, Taken at Birth. Blasio spent much of her teen years trying to unearth information at her local library about Hicks and his clinic. After spotting the information on her birth certificate, which illegally listed Jim and Joan as her parents, she made her first trip to McKaysville, 
followed by numerous others in 1988 when she was 23 after Joan's death from cancer. Before she died, Jones made her husband promise to tell Blasio everything, what she learned from her late adoptive father and more her more than three decades spent investigating Hicks in his clinic shocked and angered her. My parents bought a child in a way that gave me no option but to search and possibly find no answers. That's not love. That's desperation. Oh, imagine that. Imagine that being found out you were sold as a baby. Wow. Oh, scary. Very, very scary. Let's go back to NASA for a second. On June 25th, astronaut Shane Kimbrough and Thomas Pesquette successfully completed an almost a seven-hour extravehicular activity or spacewalk to install solar panels on the International Space Station. What does it take to don a spacesuit and venture out on such a technical and dangerous mission? Surprisingly, one of the main criteria, besides years of training, is body size. EVA capabilities blossomed during the era of NASA's shuttle Space shuttle, astronauts, robotic, uh, road robotic arms floated tetherless through the void using jetpacks to steer, corralled satellites by hand, and built the International Space Station. They've done it all while wearing space suits to, based on the design first developed for the Apollo missions in the 1960s. Each suit is a human shaped spacecraft featuring a backpack that houses primary life support system, a layered pressurized outer garment to protect astronauts from the space environment, and a long john undergarment that circulates chilled water via tubes over the body to stop the astronauts from getting too hot inside their suits. When designing the next-gen spacesuits in 1974, NASA offer, opted for a modular tuxedo approach in which various components, upper torso, lower torso, helmet, arms, and gloves could be mixed and matched to fit individual astronauts. Those suits came in five sizes, from extra small to extra large. But fast forward 47 years, and Kimbrough and Pesquette were wearing those exact same spacesuits while working on the ISS, despite the fact that the suits were only designed to last 15 years. These days, NASA spacesuits are less likely to be spoke tailoring and more like remainder stock at an outlet mall. Of the 18 suits originally made for the, by the next-gen program, only four suits still remain. Four were lost in the Challenger and Columbia disasters, and others came to an end of their working lives when weren't replaced. This also means to be selected for an ISS spacewalk, an astronaut must fit one of the two remaining available sizes, men's medium or men's large. Well, we know I'm out. I'm an XL. The first all-female EVA planned for March 2019 had to be postponed because only one medium-sized suit was available. Another medium suit was eventually cobbled together from spares. And astronaut Christina Koch and Jessica Meir successfully performed their groundbreaking spacewalk on October 18, 2019. However, is it time for new suits? Now, no one has died in an EVA, but there have been some close calls. The first ever spacewalk by Soviet cosmonaut Alexei Leonov in 65 almost ended in disaster when the expansion of his suit in the vacuum of space almost prevented him from re-entering the capsule. Now, and on July 16, 2013, Luca Parmitano entered the history books with two firsts, first Italian to perform a spacewalk, and the first near drowning in space. A week before his EVA, one of the water pipes in his spacesuit had sprung a leak, but this information was not passed up the chain of command, and mission controllers authorized his EVA to begin. Within an hour, Luca had almost two liters of water in his helmet, leaving him struggling to breathe, unable to see out of his visor or communicate with colleagues. Luca said he used a, his tether to navigate his way back to the safety of the airlock. No doubt he and other astronauts could use some new body suits, and especially body suits for women, since their bodies are a lot different than men's. Los Angeles potheads are crying tonight, bawling their eyes out after police seize more than 370,000 marijuana plants and harvested product with an estimated street value of $1 billion. The L.A. County Sheriff's Department said 131 people were arrested, 33 guns were taken in the 10-day operation in Antelope Valley, north of L.A., in addition to the marijuana plants, 
More than 33,480 pounds of harvested hippie lettuce, or more than 16 tons, were also seized. As big as the effort involving hundreds of law enforcement officers, authorities reached only about 40% of the illegal grows officials identified, which highlighted their scope of the problem that officials said was leaked to organized drug trafficking groups. Hold on, I got a moth in here that's driving me nuts. Go away. Anyways, second week of the operation, the first week they had already tried rebuilding the grows, Sheriff Alex Villanueva said California voters legalized recreational pot use in 2016 and the first sales began legally in 2018. This is not a war on the legal cannabis business in California, said U.S. Representative Mike Garcia. Growers in the Antelope Valley, which is in the high desert area, have been stealing water from hydrants and using illegal wells, using toxic and banned chemicals and dumping them where they poison the environment and some are armed. The area is home to protected species, including Mojave ground squirrels and desert tortoise in the iconic Joshua Tree area. Growers cut down the trees to make room for greenhouses, have blocked streams and polluted water with trash and pesticides, said Chloe Hakim, a biologist with the State Department of Fish and Wildlife. There's a lot of important critical species that are out there that need their habitat to thrive and survive. Officials shut down 205 of around 500 illegal grows that have been identified from the air, Villanueva said. The marijuana was destroyed. Of the arrests, 22 were on felony counts, but were but the rest were on misdemeanor allegations. The sheriff said the district attorney will make the charging decisions. Bad potters. Bad potters. A drawing of a bear's head by Leonardo da Vinci has sold for a record $12.1 million at a London auction. Measuring just 7 by 7 centimeters, head of a bear is more than 500 years old. The sale of, has per, surpassed the previous record for a Leonardo drawing set by Horse and Rider, which sold for, oh, about $11 million back in 2001. According to the Christie's Auction House, which held the sale, it is among just a few drawings by the Italian Renaissance master, which are still privately owned. The auction house did not reveal the identity of the buyers. However, it was sold to a single bid from a man and woman. The drawing was created using silver point on pale pink beige paper and is among a number of the artist's small-scale drawings of animals, which date back to the early 1480s. Letitia Mason an expert in old master drawings at Christie's describes silver point as a very difficult technique because it doesn't really admit any mistake. It involves applying a silver stick to a specifically and specially prepared paper to leave marks and lines required uh, delicate touch and pressure. Moth is back. And anyways, moving on. The sketch previously belonged to British painter and collector Sir Thomas Lawrence before being sold at Christie's in 1860 for two and a half pounds. It's been included in a number of exhibitions, notably a major show in the National Gallery in London in 2011. Leonardo da Vinci, who was born in 1452, died in 1519, is famous for both his art and inventions. Very cool. Very cool. There it is. Got it. Got it. Screw you. There it is. Anyways, let's go to another story here. We'll go to this one. Florida man talking, uh, taking a walk on the beach found a four-inch tooth from a prehistoric megalodon shark just three weeks after he found a smaller tooth from the same species on the same beach. Jacob Danner said he was walking on Fernandina Beach on Thursday morning after Tropical Storm Elsa swept through the area when he came across the tooth. Danner said he found the tooth where he had found a three-inch megalodon tooth three weeks earlier. Yep, imagine that. Just walking on the beach and finding megalodon teeth. <laughs> Thought of the day happens every night at this time where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages, then read your responses on the air because we love the audience participation around here. 
Today's thought of the day is as follows. Your thoughts on people encountering prehistoric creatures. Lori, possibly there are places that humans have not been to or just passing through. Who knows, man still is discovering new species. Then some might be crossing over to parallel universes. John believes they're true. Lee does not. He says, are you sorrius? Sorrius. Yes. Danny, doubtful, more likely misidentified animals or yet discovered animals like Mokile Babembe, most likely a type of large semi-aquatic lizard. Preston, isn't that a state of America called Florida? Davey, I think that they are all a result of time quakes. Kit Kat. But if we got the T-Rex arms wrong and they were actually wings, people, we'd have a dragon. Barry, whenever one deals with a lawyer or a politician, they're basically dealing with a megalodon shark. True. Danny, they may have watched too much Land of the Lost. Deb, I don't know. People have claimed to have seen pterodactyls throughout history. Everett, if people are encountering them, doesn't that, by the rules of grammar, make prehistoric an unqualified modifier? Do you even own a red pen anymore, Dave? Thanks, Everett. Josh, highly possible. We have yet to chart out the entire Earth. We haven't even explored a giant portion of our oceans. Penman, I would suggest that you wear camouflage clothes, carry a flamethrower, and take someone along that you can outrun when looking for prehistoric creatures, Dave. That's what I got Mark for. Michelle, one of our biggest fears, I keep a glass of water on my bedside table just in case. Clearly, the people who do encounter them didn't follow this surreptitious piece of advice from Jurassic Park and couldn't get away before their lives were changed forever by one sighting. Candace, I know three people, two of them personally, one was my cousin, and the third was a university professor I had lunch with who each saw a pterodactyl in broad daylight unmistakable, undeniable pterodactyls, for real. My guess is that they cross through a time portal. And Dave gets the final word. I petted a horseshoe crab once. It was lovely. Thank you to everybody participating in the Thought of the Dave. We will do it all again tomorrow. Thank you for everyone tuning us in for the SOR Newswire. And, of course, to Alex Mistretta coming on to talk. Mokili Babembe, pterodactyls dinosaurs are they still around today the mystery continues we got mr ron bumblefoot thaw rocking in the background with little brother is watching bumblefoot is the official music of spaced out radio rocking us in and out of every single show get your horns up for the guitar god himself special thanks to everybody listening in at home at work in your cars wherever you may be Thank you to everyone listening in in our chat rooms tonight. YouTube, Twitch, LGAB, Revolution Radio, Spreaker, Facebook, the Space Travelers Club, and on Twitter at hashtag Spaced Out Radio. I know you're out there somewhere. Remember, this show is copyright by Spaced Out Radio and SOR Media Ventures Limited. Thank you so much for choosing to share your evening with us. Because together, my friends, we own the night. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Yes, the Wu train has docked for the night. But soon, my friends, we shall ride again. Your seats are always available. Your tickets never expire. And if you want to bring a friend, we've got room for them too. Good night. Hmm. It's a good show. Alex was solid tonight. Only swore once. Hey, Super Quest. How you doing, buddy? Good to see you. Big J, what's happening? You didn't get an alert for tonight? That's weird. Um, 
You know, I didn't get a an alert for UFO Garage earlier either. <sighs> Ellen Holm, thank you. All right, let's uh, download this show. Close that off. So happy to finally kill that moth. He was on serious speed drugs. Total speed drugs. All uh, right. Jurassic Joey, how are you? Thanks, Fab. Don't Canadians eat moths like nothing and eat rats and stuff because they don't have electricity and are living in the woods like cavemen? Yes, my candles are iridescent to that. God, I got Ernie McCracken hair right now. Moths got to be the stupidest animal or insect around. Honestly, they're stupid. See, Cosmic Fleur gets it. Why she has a French name living in the US, Cosmic Fleur. All right, finally, that's... All right, there we go. Let's load up the commercials. Where am I? There I am. Hi. Hi, D. Swiger. Wow, you can really dance. Wow, you can really dance.
Love you, Cloudy. Welcome back next time. <clears throat> Any questions, comments? Besides Fap saying I'm going to get attacked by Mothman. Fab's one of those guys who would make an Instagram video of lip syncing songs while riding a, a goat. Fab is all about the clicks. Mondak, what's happening? Behoff. <clears throat> Uh, Jack Sarfati would be an interesting guest for sure. Uh, send it to bookings at spacedoutradio.com or info at spacedoutradio.com. We can try and track down Mr. Sarfati for you. That would be an interesting interview for sure. Who's on Instagram here? If you're not following us at Spaced Out Radio Show or at Dave Scott SOR, then you're going to get a shaking. But uh, in the meantime, I watch a lot of those Instagram uh, videos. There's some talented people out there, real talented people. What do I want to hear, James? That's over an hour. That's very true, Fab. <laughs> Uh, your head is too big to upload a photo. Oh, my gosh. How did you manage on, on Tinder when they had to swipe 34 times to get past you? That's what I want to know. I could see FAP getting banned from Pinterest. B 
bitching out old ladies for not using yarn properly. That's not the way you macrame, you old hag. Thanks, Paul Holland. Now, will you put me in your will for your blue Les Paul? And the white one. And the black one. And all of them. Oh, I like those. I like those. What color is yours, B. Hoff? Do you get a black one or a white one? Most likely, I'll say you got a black one. Notice Paul Holland's awfully silent. I'm about putting me in his will for his less balls. Hey, for Tret. Yes, we are live on Twitter right now. Alex Kuhn, what's happening? Oh, Paul Holland has cut me out of the will for his Les Pauls. Mmm. Mmm. That one hurts, Paul Holland. I thought we had something going on. That one hurts right in the feels. This is my daughter's Jackson right here. Oh, I love this guitar. That's uh, it's beautiful. My son has a Jackson upstairs, too. I just love the headstock on these. Like, they're just so badass. They're like, fuck yeah, we rock. You know? That's not bad. Sounds way out. Sounds way out. I introduced my son to Voodoo Child this morning.
I suck at picking upwards. Really suck at picking upwards. It's one thing I'm trying to practice, and I suck at it. I didn't realize picking upwards would be so hard. That's the string that's out. I can't play Nirvana yet. I don't know how. better. That's why I screw up. fingers <clears throat> I'm practicing this is how you learn yes I do pick too hard my guitar teacher actually told me that and apparently I'm using too hard of a pick too not enough bend in it I will not be discouraged from learning how to play. <clears throat> the other thing that I'm trying to learn is the proper scaling, too. I'm not very good at that.
Where are you from, Fruitret? Or Fruitret? Yeah. I'm so wrong here. Hey, Preston Beckett. <clears throat> Hey, Fox Hunter. So wrong here right now. I'm trying to practice my scales. Oh, he knows that. We're learning two things at once. I'm just trying to learn my scale, too. I'm not good at it. i got to speed it up. Damn, you're cruel, Fabster. <laughs> oh, you're so cruel to me. Thank you. I appreciate you. Understanding my little.
Vinny, that might be too soon, that one, man. That might be too soon. Hey, Valro, how you doing? Mokile Mabembe. Guys are cruel. You know, one of my biggest problems is I can figure out I can figure out where my fingers go, but I cannot remember for the life of me the name of the notes. And that drives me nuts. Look, that's the same chord. I'll stop. I'm getting frustrated. Thank you for the reminder, Jennifer Hawkins. Appreciate that.
interesting. Um, no problem, Fap. Hey, Cooper and Coop's beard. What's happening, buddy? Oh, Coop and Coop's beard. Hey, gorgeous Larry. What's happening, man? It's only 1230 here. I'm done. Frustrated. There we go. I'm just, no, Dave can't sing very well. Hi, Silent Edge. I'd love to do a guitar show. I just don't know how to play. And I'm getting really frustrated. All right, everyone, we're going to shut it down for tonight. Big thank you to Alex uh, for coming on and uh, talking some monsters with us. Big thank you to Fabster, Ozzy, Steve, Magnus, Jeremy, Dirty Filth, Adam, and Ed for the Super Chats. Thank you to all our veterans who listen to this show. We love you. And, of course, to all of our regulars in the chat room, love you too. Uh, tomorrow night on the show... Uh, let me check here. 
We have Brandon Wainwright. <clears throat> Going to be talking about intuition. This guy who became psychic after his dog died. It's actually kind of a really cool story. So we'll talk to you tomorrow night. And appreciate each and every one of you. Have a great day. We're one do day, one doy. One day away from the weekend. And uh, let's bring the woo tomorrow night. Take care, everyone. Good night.